good morning everyone welcome to the one day national level e conference on the story of storytelling a study in the changing patterns of storytelling organized by the department of english seva bharati mahavidyalay kapgadi jhargram and the department of english gorobwin memorial college chandrapuna road pashchim medinipur i am dr samit kumar maithi assistant professor and head of the department english uh, head of the department of english seva bharati mahavidyalay now i invite dr saurav pal assistant professor and hod department of english gorobwin memorial college and the convener of this e conference for the welcome address please saurav da thank you samit Uh, a very good morning to all of you i dr shorop pal as the convener of this present webinar along with dr shomit maithi the joint convener of this program welcome all the honorable guests respected resource persons our colleagues dear students and all other participants to this one day national level e conference entitled the story of storytelling organized by the department of english Gorakhwin Memorial College and the Department of English of Shiva Bharati Mahavidyalay in collaboration. First of all, I must say that we are overwhelmed by the response. Uh, am i audible samit yeah yeah okay first of all i must say that we are overwhelmed by the response that we have received from you regarding this webinar in the last few days a number of scholars and academicians from different institutions have shown their interest in the theme we have chosen and gladly accepted our invitation to grace us with their erudite presence Thank you all for your kind words. We hope to fulfill your expectation in the ensuing technical sessions. Uh, we are very fortunate to have among us our four learned resource persons who have kindly agreed to deliver their talks over various aspects of the changing patterns of storytelling. We have among us Professor Amrit Sen. respected professor of the department of english and other modern european languages vishwavarati university who will deliver his lecture entitled from amatory fiction to metafiction telling the story in the 18th century novel in the first technical session we have professor niladri ranjan chatterjee respected professor of the department of english university of kollani west bengal who will speak on the politics of the narrative in the second technical session in the third technical session we have our respected guest from the department of english and cultural studies of punjab university professor akshay kumar who has kindly given his consent to speak on hindi short story towards a non prescriptive ethical realism the speaker of our fourth technical session is mr Devadikto Mukhopadhyay assistant professor of the department of english manikshak college malda who will speak on a very interesting uh, topic his speech being entitled formula and beyond mapping the tellings and retellings in crime narratives so we shall eagerly wait for for quite amazing and enlightening sessions ahead we are lucky to have among us our two chief patrons present today to inaugurate our webinar and inspire us to do our best dr tapan hazra respected teacher in charge of gorab gwin memorial college and dr binod choudhury respected vice principal of shiva bharati mahavidyalay we shall soon come to them and request them to say a few inspiring words regarding our webinar at the same time we thank our two patrons mr vishnu pada vattacharji administrator of Shiva Bharati Mahavidyalay and Sri Kanthi Mahathir 
Hello. Uh, President of the governing body of Gorobwin Memorial College for their support in organizing this webinar. But before we move on, it is my duty to briefly introduce the theme of our webinar, which is entitled The Story of Storytelling, a Study in the Changing Patterns of Storytelling. I shall start by quoting a remark by Reynolds Price in his book, A Palpable God. Price says in this book, quote unquote, a need to tell and hear stories is essential to the species Homo sapiens, second in necessity apparently after nourishment and before love and shelter. Millions survive without love or home, almost none in silence. The opposite of silence leads quickly to narrative and the sound of story is the dominant sound of our lives. From the small accounts of our day's events to the vast incommunicable constructs of psychopaths. Indeed, storytelling predates writing and even the formation of a structured language. Our prehistoric ancestors tried to tell stories of their lives by painting pictures on cave walls or rocks. With the development of language in a more civilized world, storytelling became rather a collective cultural practice with the improvised narratives of impromptu storytellers at the end of the day's work, which were then committed to memory and passed from generation to generation. They served the purpose of enlightenment and spiritual guidance as well as that of recording and passing their views of the world and human existence to the next generation. Thus, we find the myths and legends, folk tales and fables handed down to us through oral narratives. From the visual storytelling of the cave paintings through the oral mode that combined narrative with performing arts, the Homo sapiens then entered the age of the written story transcribed on the stable and portable media. In oral traditions, stories are kept alive by being told again and again by different storytellers with natural variations. When oral storytelling was pushed back in favor of the written, especially with the advent of the print media, the idea of the author as originator of a story's authoritative version changed the perception of stories themselves. In centuries following, stories tended to be seen as an individual's copyright rather than a collective effort. Only recently, the value of stories as such, independent of authorship, was again recognized. Literary critics such as Rolla Burke even proclaimed the death of, death of the author. In the present era, we have come full circle to return again to the primary technique of visual storytelling with TV, films, social media, and the virtual reality created by computer graphics. The internet has created a space for blogs, posting pictures and events that we attend. Uh, social media has become the modern way we tell the stories of our lives in the 21st century. Various new forms of storytelling in contemporary media, each with its own narrative technique and objectives have developed, to a few of which I will draw your kind attention. Advertisements tell feel-good stories about a product or rouse fear of lagging behind in case of not using it. They are the myths of the modern capitalist world as Barth tells us in mythologies. Online or offline VR game, games position the gamer as a character within a fictional world to develop the story himself. Interactive fiction softwares provide simulating environments in which players use text comments to control characters in an interactive and collaborative mode of storytelling. Human beings have always tried to construct their lives and shape their world and even build their personal and cultural identity through storytelling. Such narratives, whether it is a folklore or a novel or a film, involve both aesthetics and political praxis in their representation of the human experience. We can therefore treat narratives as politically motivated stories, stories empowering certain groups and giving people agency. Often we find a dominant narrative and its subversive variants giving two different versions of the same event. So it is very important to ask whose interest does a narrative serve and whether it legitimates or dominates or resists and empowers. All narratives 
can be seen as ideological because they evolve from a structure of power relation and simultaneously produce, maintain, or attempt to subvert that power structure. Our present e-conference looks forward to trace all these issues, keeping within its purview the broad area from folk culture to modern electronic media. Now it's time to come to our two chief patrons and request, request them to say a few words to us. Unfortunately, Dr. Tapun Hajra, respected teacher in charge of Gorab Queen Memorial College, could not join us at present. So I would turn to Dr. Binod Choudhury, respected vice principal of Sheva Bharati Mahavid Dalai, and request him to say a few words. Sir, if you can share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today, I am very pleased to know that the Department of English of Devavarti Mahavidyalaya, in collaboration with the Department of English, Gaurav Guin Memorial College, Chandrakona Road, Pashtin Medhnipur, is going a, to organ, organizing a one-day e-conference on a very interesting topic, the story of storytelling, the story in the changing pattern of storytelling. On behalf of Seabharti Mahavidyalaya, I welcome all the eminent resource persons of the conference, students and participants. Seabharti Mahavidyalaya was established on 17th July 1964 and it was established by Dr. Prabhitra Kumar Shed, an eminent educationist. The purpose was to provide higher education to the students of rural area of Jhargam subdivision of former Medipur district. Our vision was, vision has been to transfer our Mahavidyalaya into a center of excellence in the field of higher education. Mahavidyalaya, aim of excellence in the field of higher education. The Mahavidyalaya aims at the holistic development of the younger learners and hope to make them into responsible and good citizen of nation. We believe that education is the continuous process. It, it cannot stop, even during the time of pandemic. Keeping in mind the academic well-being of the students, the English Department of College, in collaboration with the Department of English, Gaurav Gwyn Memorial College, Chandrakona Road, Pashtim Medhnipur, has organized this one-day e-conference. I express my thanks to the president, teacher in charge, teachers of Gaurav Gwyn Memorial College for their initiative to organize such a conference. This kind of collaboration among the colleges will be beneficial for the students of both the colleges. I hope that the lectures will be profitable for everyone, particularly for the students of English owners under CBCS system introduced by Vidyasagar University from the academic session 2018 and 19. Once again, I thank all the dignities, resource persons, teachers, students, and participants, and we say grand success of the conference. Thank you. Okay, Sumit. Sumit. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Uh, Dear participants, the focus of this e-conference is the story of storytelling, or we can say the evolution of the art of storytelling. Man is a natural lover of story, and storytelling has been a very popular form of communication from the time immemorial. Naturally, with the evolution of man, his society and culture, this art of storytelling had undergone a steady evolution. Although cave paintings, folk tales, fables, parables, the news on television, radio, social media, and in the newspaper are all but stories. We would specifically focus on the literary forms of storytelling in fiction, short stories, and detective fictions. To discuss about the changing patterns of storytelling in the 18th century British fiction, we have in this technical session a distinguished scholar, a renowned speaker, and one of the finest teachers that I have ever seen, Professor Amrit Sen. Professor Amrit Sen is presently professor and former head, Department of English 
and other modern European languages at, at Bissovarati, Santi Niketan. Interested in 18th century studies, travel writing, studies, and uh, history of science, he has won outstanding research award for his doctoral dissertation, The Narcissistic Mode, Metafiction as a Strategy in Wolfhander, Tom Jones, and Tristram Sandy, published in 2007. Some of his major publications and edited volume include Gitanjali, the centenary edition in 2012, Rabindranath Tagore, the unsung hero, published by Bissowarati in 2013, Rabindranath Tagore and his circle, published by Bissowarati in 2015, Sharing the Dream, the remarkable women of Kantinigatan, published by Bissowarati in 2016, Confluence of Minds, the Rabindranath Tagore and Patrick Gede, reader on education and the environment, co-edited with Tapati Mukhopadhyay and Vasubhi Fraser, published in 2017. The Scottish Enlightenment and the Bengal Renaissance, the Continuum, continuum of Ideas, uh, published in 2017. Santiniketan for visitors and the Bengali chemist Acharya Prakulla Chandraroy and Poor Maulonyali. Published in 2017, and Bosundhara, Rabindranath Tagore and the Environment, published in 2018. He is joint coordinator of the UGC UKIERI project on the Scotland India continuum, Tagore and Circle, and the deputy coordinator of the UGC SAP project on Rabindranath Tagore, the East West Conference at the Department of English. He is presently also the joint editor of the Vishwabharati Quarterly. Among his major awards, he has won the Outstanding Thesis Award by the Government of India, the Research Award by the UGC, the Oxford 18th Century Bursary, and a host of academic recognitions. He has traveled extensively on project, uh, as project coordinator for the UKIERI Award to Edinburgh, Scotland, as invited speaker to the University of Oxford and Twickenham. He has also delivered the Tagore Memorial Lecture at the Rabindranath Tagore Center under the Mahatma Gandhi Institute at Mauritius. Professor Amrit Sen is also presently officiating as the director of Granthana Vibhaga, the publication wing of Bharati since July 2018. With this very short introduction, I uh, welcome and request Professor Amrit Sen to kindly begin his speech. Sir, please proceed. Okay, am I audible? Yes, sir. Right. Thank you, Shomit. And uh, I congratulate the officials and the administration of the two colleges that they have collaborated together to uh, organize this e-conference on the story of storytelling itself. And I'll begin with a very short uh, but humorous uh, story itself. That when the conference... Uh, was initiated, I was supposed to go in second, and somebody else, Niladri, was supposed to come in first. But due to a hiatus and an interruption, Niladri is now has some official engagement, and he'll come in after me. Now, the point is that storytelling is, you see, something which is slightly interrupted, random, and very often takes up sudden twists and turns. And therefore, storytelling involves not only the presence of a story, a storyteller, but also an audience. And storytelling is also integrally associated with the concept of the context, the context in which the story is told. Some stories, of course, move beyond contexts. Myths, for example, are stories that remain, you know, read beyond their context, put into context, reshaped. The same story can be told in many ways. And the storytelling itself becomes the subject of a story, which becomes an exercise in self-reflexivity. It is with these words of introduction that I would like to interrogate storytelling with uh, the help of the, uh, the 
the art of storytelling with the help of the 18th century. Uh, is my uh, PowerPoint audible to you? Uh, I'm sorry, visible to you? Shomit, could you just respond? Is the PowerPoint visible no, to you? No, no, sir. Please share no, screen. No. Yeah, I, I have shared the screen. Is it visible? Is it? It's still not visible. No, sir. Not yet. OK. Let me try once again. Because uh, I have a PowerPoint, so without that, it becomes a little difficult. Mm. StreamYard is sharing your screen, it says. OK, let's try once again. Uh, screen sharing, share screen. Mm, application window. OK. Now? Is it visible uh, no, now? No, 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 sir. Just click on the image. Click on the image uh, on the on the stream here, and uh, click on no, the. Of course, share I, 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 I have shared the screen, but unfortunately, some, uh, somewhere this is. Okay, let's try this out once again. Uh, stop screen. Share screen once again. Now? No, sir. OK. OK. Yes, sir. Now it is visible. It's visible. Right. Yeah. OK. So uh, I'm putting it on full screen so that you can see it properly. Mm. Just give me a second, please. Yeah. Now is it visible, the full screen? Shomit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go on. All right. Thank you. So the point that I wanted to suggest is that storytelling is dependent upon three factors. The story itself is, of course, important. The storyteller is important. And the audience is equally important. Equally important is the context of storytelling. And what is the relationship or the interrelationship between these aspects, especially at a time when storytelling takes on a new form in the most popular form of storytelling for us today, and that is the novel, is the subject of my discussion. I've titled it From Amatory Fiction to Metafiction, Telling the Story in the 18th Century Novel. Now, what are my questions? Let me phrase my research questions early. How does storytelling depend upon particulars of time and place? The novel, as many of you will immediately recognize, defined by Bakhtin in terms of a chronotope rooted in its time and place. And therefore, how does the storytelling in the novel depend upon it? What went before the novel? What comes after the novel? How do factors like literacy, readership, except affect the directions of storytelling is the second question I'll be asking. The third question is, what happens when storytelling faces a crisis? Because this has been the pattern of storytelling. You have forms which are repeated, repeated, and they become ossified. And then they are reinvented. You know, discerning uh, students of literature will immediately recognize the critic that I am uh, using here, Shlovsky and the Russian formalists, including Todorov. But I'd like to just add a caveat here that my discussion is restricted to print narratives, especially 18th century print narratives, and not oral ones, because I would say that the dynamics of storytelling in oral narratives is largely different. Now, what happened to the 18th century? Why am I choosing the 18th century and saying that storytelling undergoes a paradigm shift at this point of time? These are because of a few factors the acceleration of the reading public and print culture, reading across classes. Who reads is a very important factor of you know, reading a story or understanding a story. Sociopolitical flux, of course, you will realize the entire dynamics of the Enlightenment coming in. The rise of news as a genre. So we have a new form of storytelling 
rapidly proliferating and this is what I'll call the discourse of news. Now, many of you will immediately say, so what? News did exist earlier. Yes, it did, but not in this proliferated, dispersed way among the masses. It existed in a very rudimentary fashion. So all of you will, of course, now realize that news is a very important mode of storytelling. And then I will come to this question of the news novels discourse, because for the first time during the 18th century, we have something called a new storytelling mode described in the novel. Of course, there existed the pre-existing myths, legends, which have never really disappeared. How did they adjust to this shift? And then comes how this new form of storytelling seeks to tell its own story through a self-reflexive mode. Now the question comes, therefore, what went before the period? Prose narratives, especially as romances, you know, French romances. The English did not really have a very important romance, romance tradition. It largely imitated it from the, the, from the French. You had prose narratives as allegories. An example would be Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, where you have one story as such on the surface, but the real impact of the narrative lies in the allegory. You had fewer available forms of storytelling, unidimensional narrative patterns. If you take a look at ideologies, which Chorab was just mentioning, the ideology of storytelling was extremely conservative, either in terms of class, romances were very class specific, or in terms of religion and morality, because religious narratives, of course, you understand would stick to the conservative pattern. Also important is that storytelling till this point of time is a very gendered act. If you've ever thought about this, uh, you know, oral narratives, the classical ones are largely patriarchal. But if you have the domestic storytelling motif, then you've heard your grandmother speak. And these are stories which have a distinct potential uh, uh, sort of gendered bias. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Did storytelling in this period of time, was it affected by changing notions of gender? And of course, readership. The change in readership, I would say, changed storytelling also. So we have a context, we have a reader, we have a storyteller, we have a story, all of which are in flux. And therefore, a whole new sort of equation is emerging in the process of storytelling. Now, I do not need to really go through this, but all of you know about this, but I'd just like to point out uh, the rise of literacy, which moves almost 200 percent between 1600 and 1700 in males, 400 percent in females. Rise of circulating libraries, therefore, you know, books are available at a penny. In the 1620s, 6,000 titles appear in England. 1710, it is 21,000. And by 1790, it is 56,000. You can just guess the kind of ratio of texts that are produced. And so on and so forth with printers. You see, 1725, 75. 1818, it's 3365, right? So I'm just taking a look at the explosion in print culture. So new stories were demanded, new stories were supplied. Now, Michael McKeon's story about the origins of the novel, which is in fact, one of the definitive histories, stories of the rise of the novel, talks about three philosophical traditions of storytelling, right? The first storytelling that uh, the mode of philosophical mode of storytelling it talks about is the romance idealism, where storytelling is about something that is not really human, but beyond the human, that is ideal, right? And therefore, emotions, sentiments, languages are rarefied. This is again extremely patriarchal. 
Now, in the 17th and 18th centuries, the shift of storytelling turns towards the contemporary, right? Therefore, news, news is about today, us, now. You know, yesterday's news is no longer news in that sense of the term. Therefore, this is based on a philosophy of naive empiricism, naive, simple empiricism. This just records, right? Therefore, you have entire forms of storytelling coming up. The diary, for example, the periodical essay, for example, it's telling the story. Addison is telling a story to us through the Spectator Club. You have, you know, autobiographies which are telling us stories, urgent stories of today. Journals, peeps, Evelyn, diaries, all forms of storytelling coming up. And then comes a critical form of empirical storytelling, which interrogates how the story is being told. And therefore, you have what we will call, or Macion will call, extreme skepticism. Take Gulliver's Travels, for example, which tells a story but satirizes the art of storytelling. Tom Jones tells a story, interrogates it. And of course, the father of all these, you know, not the father really, you know, the, the, you know, the ultimate moment in 18th century narratives that is turned with his self-reflexivities, right? Therefore, these are the three traditions, you know, one where you have an ideal story, two where you have a immediate empirical story, and three, where storytelling itself becomes the subject matter of the story. Now, also very important to understand is that storytelling now becomes not just a story, story in itself. Stories are being told, but they're also part and parcel of a public debate, right? And the theorist I'll use here is Jürgen Habermas. What are the stories about the penal code, criminals? Take Moll Flanders, for example. Take Jonathan Weil, for example. It's a story which is in the garb of a story, you are really discussing what the penal code should be like. The woman question, Pamela, for example. The issue of the bastard, for example, Tom Jones. The issue of midwives, for example. The penitentiary, the policing system. And this implicates storytelling squarely within the public sphere. You see, when you talked about a romance, when you told a romance, you didn't exist in the public sphere. You existed in a very rarefied aristocratic sphere. But now you have the sphere of private people come together as a public. And this is motivated by the people's public use of reason. So within this public sphere, you have the coffee house, you have the periodical essay, you have the novel. So storytelling is closely implicated within this public discourse where participatory reason is observed. Remember your Immanuel Kant, defining the Enlightenment, Kant says that the Enlightenment is marked by the people's public use of reason, not individual reasons, public use of reasons. Now let me quickly move on to the other theoretical discussion about what we will call the news novels discourse. Now today we make this distinction, or do we really, between news and fiction. But with fake news you never know really what is news and what is fiction. That same debate went on when the discourse of news proliferated. And this was called by Leonard Davis as a news novels discourse, which comprised of different storytelling forms, a matrix of writings dealing with empirical journalistic writings, which were competing genres, which actually competed for market space. And this undivided matrix used the newspaper, used the biography, used diaries, periodical essays, novels. Now take the case of Robinson Crusoe, for example, which many of our students have uh, studied, in which you are teaching. Them. It's based on the life of Alexander Selkirk, which is news. It is fictionalized in the form of Robinson Crusoe, which is a novel. So 
there's a continuous interface between news and novels so that you do not know what is really what. And therefore, no genre is privileged. But what are the genres, actually? You have criminal biographies. So Jonathan Wilde's biography is being written, and Fielding is writing Jonathan Wilde. Moll King becomes Moll Flanders. You have whore biographies, prostitutes biographies. You have sensational narratives. You have, uh, you have discourses on religious people. All these go into the making of different forms of empirical storytelling. Now, the problem, therefore, is, therefore, if we consider this to be the major form, then where does the romance go? Where does the pornographic go? Because these are also forms of storytelling, you see. Now, once again, why the news novels discourse? Because a new readership is coming through, which is dispersed across classes. And therefore, the news novels discourse has historically answered the needs of the lower classes to be informed about the public events. And the kind of undifferentiated matrix out of which journalism and history will dis be distinguished from novels. Now, this exists as an amorphous mass. From this point onwards, different strands of storytelling will be segregated. Right. <clears throat> now, an interesting thesis is offered, of course, by uh, a critic whom I am never, never ceased to be fascinated with is Ian Watt. Watt suggests that storytelling was involved with three movements. The rise of the middle class, right? This meant newer stories, newer characters, newer readerships. The rise of literacy, you know, until and unless you could read the story, you couldn't participate. So literacy goes up. The middle, middling class, that's the Defoe's, that's Defoe's term, by the way. And you therefore have a new form of storytelling, the rise of the novel. And what suggests that the basic feature of this new form of storytelling is the repudiation of traditional plots and figurative eloquence. So no longer allegories, no longer the traditional plots of romance, but the particularization of character and background. So now Tom Jones, Somersetshire, naming, temporality, causation, probability and possibility, and physical environment, tangible, identifiable reality in terms of storytelling. No longer once upon a time in some far off land, right? So what suggests that this new form of storytelling has a lowest common denominator as a whole of as formal realism. This is the term that he uses. And this is going to be the USP, really, of the novelistic form of storytelling across the next two centuries. Along with that, I'm borrowing an idea from William Warner. Now, Warner is one of those critics who's redefined the concept of the reader, really. And he says that, you know, storytelling also depends on how reading practices change. So he suggests that earlier, reading involved very few books because books were very costly things. So you can't go to the household, the father would read the Bible on a Sunday with all the people around him. So reading in a group with few books. Now what happens is he says you have many similar books which are read individually within the closet. Right. Therefore, you have particularized individual reading. Remember this. When you read a novel, do you read it together or do you read it alone? Now. Earlier, no, texts are read for profit. And this is one of the first pictures of a, of, an, of a clergyman reading a religious text. You have, therefore, if you look at that picture, you have a faceless, almost asexual face of this clergy man or woman, probably man because there were no clergy women, really. And you have light on the page of 
this book reflected onto his face. So reading for profit. Now, at this point comes a very interesting genre about which we know very little, and that is amatory fiction. These are being written by women, right? And they are being written as tales which border on the pornographic. And they talk about women participating in the public sphere, erotic subjects who freely enter into sexual liaisons and are there and the crisis that they face, right? Who were the people who were writing this? The generations of Amazons of the pen, that was what Johnson, Dr. Johnson defined them as. The fair triumvirate of wit included Afra Ben, Delarivere Manley, and Eliza Haywood. <coughs> I repeat, single lone woman comes to the city, goes to public places, meets up young rakes, participates freely in sexual desire, changes identities, participates again in sexuality, and then finally is either punished or banished. But the language borders on the erotic, on the pornographic, written by women, and therefore they become hugely popular amongst a new group of readers, and that is the women. And you see, by 1725, this is when approximately Gulliver's Travels is being published. You know, Haywood accounted for 35 novels. It was much more popular than Defoe. 70% of the total output between 1710 from 1710 to 25 actually comes from Haywood. Right. This is the woman whom I'm talking about. And see how she's portrayed in terms of this, you know, cleavage, the sexuality that she exudes, as it were. And you see this language, a discourse on desire and love. And you can see, my soul's on the wing, oh, enjoyment, unable for expression. I melt, I die, I live. You know, it's almost semi-pornographic, just bordering on the pornographic. And this is a 1725 text, which I've offered as uh, one of the texts to be taught in many of my classes. Phantomina and the love in a maze. Uh, this was one of the most famous novelettes of Eliza Haywood. And you see how the reading changes. You see, this is a clergyman reading out to a group of young ladies, and they look at the boredom that they face. And here comes an amatory fiction that she's reading out to her friends, and look at how animated they are. Right. Nothing sells like sex, does it? And you can see how what happens to young women who are reading this. Now, look at that. Look at that, you know, entire picture, this dress sort of going down from her. She's sort of relaxing in her bed couch, almost fantasizing about the sexuality, sexually titillating fictions that she has read. And you see how the book now becomes an organ of sexuality, as it were, transferring not knowledge, but erotic pleasure. Now, this is where the novel becomes important, because at the end of the day, the novel uh, at, with the amatory fiction is about pleasure and only about pleasure. Now, what are the responses? Obviously, patriarchy is not going to let amatory fiction go, are they? So you have actually the Archbishop of Canterbury talking about the all the generations of women who are being spoiled and later on of course they would argue that the lisbon earthquake of 1751 was caused because women were reading novels too much and in popes the dunciad haywood is shown as a prize in a pissing competition right therefore it's a huge backlash against patriarchy i'm sorry patriarchal backlash against amatory fiction now, these, by the way, were the mothers of the novel. Many of you do not even know about them. Therefore, but the novelists are aware of the popularity of this form of storytelling. They will have to live with it. Therefore, what do they do? They seek to sanitize amatory fiction through the patriarchal lens. And you have 
the first English novel, as it were, defined Pamela in 1940. Now, what does Richardson do? Richardson takes a tale of a story of a woman who is about to be seduced and raped. Pamela is the maid in Mr. B's household. Mr. B wants to rape her to possess her body. So tale of seduction, just as a military fiction had projected. What it does instead is it turns inside out by making it moral. Pamela resists this. And ultimately, because she resists him successfully, therefore, Mr. B changes and marries her. Right. And you see what Richardson is doing. Richardson is doing a moral sanitization of the erotic tale. Now, in a class, I once asked my students, did you read Pamela? They said, yes. I said, why? One of them picked up and said, because I wanted to see if the rape would actually happen. You see, she was not wrong. The narrative interest lies in whether she will be erotically seduced. But within that, Richardson is sort of slipping in a conduct book, a moral dimension. And this is where the novel, this form of storytelling becomes legitimate. And if we take a look at what Richardson has already circulated in the preface, to instruct and improve the minds of the youth of both sexes, right? And to paint vice in its proper colors to make it deservedly odious, right? Therefore, Richardson is taking a tale of seduction and, as it were, turning it inside out, adding another form of storytelling, and that is the conduct book. What to do? That's the conduct book. How to interact with your father? How to interact with your licentious master? Right? How do young girls behave? One form of storytelling. So two forms of storytelling come together, the erotic and the moral, and out of it, a new novelistic pattern emerges. And therefore, you see, if you consider the change, the erotic amatory fiction now makes way to the more social, moral way of reading. And this young girl is no longer sexualized, but the novel has been gendered. Right? The novel has been gendered, and you can see how, very importantly, one of the major features of the novel is the inclusion of the woman as a writer, the woman as a subject of fiction, and the woman as a reader of fiction. Now, that is a very important turn in the history of storytelling vis-a-vis -vis the novel. Henry Fielding, my next storyteller, defines the novel in a very big way for the first time. He says, a comic epic, comic romance is a comic epic poem in prose, differing from comedy as the serious epic from tragedy, action extended and more comprehensive, larger circle of incidents, greater variety of characters, right? And differs in its characters by introducing persons of inferior rank and consequently of inferior manners. Very interesting that. The storytelling is now focused not on the aristocracy any longer. You have, therefore, an unheroic hero. Why is the comedy used? Primarily because in Aristotle, comedy talks about inferior and lower class citizens. Therefore, the novel's hero now becomes either Joseph Andrews, who's a footman, Tom Jones, who's a bastard, Moll Flanders, who's a criminal, Pamela, who's a maid. Right. Therefore, we have a whole new turn towards storytelling, the storytelling through the unheroic hero. Now, why is Fielding important? Because Fielding recognizes that in order to survive, the novel cannot actually cut itself off from tradition. Much as it is rooted in time and space, it has to go back also to more identifiable patterns like the epic, like myth, 
like the mock heroic. And therefore, you see, if you read Tom Jones, as many of you will, you will find that it is modeled on the journey of Odysseus. It uses the themes of Milton's Paradise Lost. So the novel now seeks a continuity with the classical forms of storytelling. And therefore, Fielding talks about the ancients as a rich common where everybody is willing to draw their sustenance from. So Fielding is suggesting that this new province of writing has changed in subject, has changed in terms of readership, in terms of characters, but they're still linked to tradition through certain patterns of storytelling. But importantly, now, and this is one very important thing which I want you to note, is that the story has become a commodity, be it news, be it the novel. And how does Fielding define the storyteller now? He talks about the storyteller as an innkeeper, the novelist, not as a gentleman who gives a private treat, but one who keeps a public ordinary, an inn. Why an innkeeper? Because if you go to a hotel, some of you may want <coughs> Chinese, some of you may want Italian, some of you may want Martin Chol and Bhat, right? Similarly, if you want to go to a novel, somebody might want sex, somebody might want instruction, and somebody might want a mixture of both. Therefore, men who pay for what they will eat <coughs> will insist on gratifying their palates. So the novel now has to cater. It has become a commodity. The story has become a commodity which is to be consumed. And this is where you have the story as popular culture, the story as a consumable entity. <coughs> and what does Fielding have to say? He says that highest life is dull and therefore the callings in the various lower spheres, that is to say, the novel is dependent upon the lower classes for its survival because they want to see their lives reflected and they want to read their lives in fiction. Now, very interestingly, in terms of storytelling, Fielding says that these are the rules. I can cross boundaries of time. I can take liberties. And he says the storyteller is a tyrant. He can change as he pleases. And the audience are his subjects. And he says, I am laying down the laws for this new province of writing. Notice that for the first time, we are aware that something has new form of storytelling has emerged. Defoe had talked about a true history. Richardson had talked about a moral history. Fielding is saying, no, this is a new form of storytelling. And it is in 1765, remember, Fielding is writing this in the 1740s. 1749 is Tom Jones. 1765, that Clara Reeve will use the term novel in its modern sense for the first time. And then comes this theorization. You see, at this point, Storytelling turns towards itself and says, Who, what are your rules? So this is the moment when the story of storytelling is simultaneously told by Fielding. So in Tom Jones, you have a story of Tom, Blifail, Sophia, and so on and so forth. But you also have the prefatory chapters where Fielding is telling the story of the novel, and laying down codes. What are these codes? that he can jump across time, right? There can be flashback. Then comes this very important rule. How is it going to define or distinguish itself from the romance? Through possibility and probability, right? So the romance can defy probability, but the novel will not only remain within the realm of the possible, but also within the narrower aspect of the probable. And very importantly, that there 
can be the marvelous coincidence that Hardy uses, but never the incredible. So a man cannot suddenly become a dragon. The man can have an accident, but he cannot become a dragon. So the marvelous is possible, coincidence, but the incredible is impossible. And then comes my last storyteller in this context. I'm sorry, I should have given a photograph of him. But 1760 to 69, there's this maverick preacher, remember, a clergyman, who tells the story of Tristram Shandy. Now, Stern suggests that all storytelling is essentially falsehood. Fielding is suggesting and throughout, you see, the novel has suggested that this storytelling is an actual reflection of society. So it is claiming veracity and truth as aspects of storytelling. So you believe that there exists Tom Jones, there exists small Flanders. Stern comes in, twirls his stick and says, by Jove, all this is false. So he starts interrogating the fundamentals of storytelling. What are the fundamentals of storytelling? The character, the context, the plot, and the page. Right. So contrary to the realist novels, Stern talks about characters as hobby horses, fans, fashions, something with the author artificially creates. Right. And therefore, he suggests that these are not fully realized characters, but representations of humors or hobby horses. They are artificial. So Stern problematizes one of the fundamental aspects of storytelling, realist storytelling, the aspect of character. And therefore, they are individuals who are present in the narrative, yet they are not really individuals. They are figments of the imagination. It's challenging time. One of the major aspects of the story is that it follows chronological time. Stern is anticipating the Bergsonian Dury, that one moment of time is much more important than others. So he can define that moment of time and defy chronological time altogether. <clears throat> so the defiance against time, which storytelling turns storytelling is turning the story and looking very critically at how the story is told. Stern's importance is not in telling a story. His importance in telling is in telling how the story is told. Right. Very importantly also, when you read a book, you see the book as a kind of a repository of the story. The book is a window, as it were, into life. So through the book, you enter into what you believe is a believable realm. <coughs> what Stern does is he shows how the book is a book, how the story is also an object. Now, remember, this is not true of the oral tale. This is true of the physical print matter. And Stern suggests that this physical, this story that you see is a physical object embedded in a book. And therefore, he is using the challenges to punctuation, the use of the dash, for example, or the use, in this case, of the asterisk. He's visualizing the plot, therefore suggesting that this plot, with all its you know, ups and downs is artificial, is a way in which the artist is telling, telling a story. Take a look at Yorick's death. How does one define death? And this is where Stern says or tests the limits of storytelling, that death cannot be communicated. You cannot tell the story of death. Therefore, the black page. How does one tell the story of the beautiful woman? Therefore, you have the blank page where Widow Wardman's definition, uh, Widow Wardman's beauty is sought to be inscribed by the reader. 
So Stern makes the reader a participant in the storytelling process by showing that the storytelling is itself artificial. And therefore, you have this marble page, which is probably my last real uh, slide of this presentation, where Stern suggests that, you know, this is what the novel is like. Storytelling is like a marbled page where every single story, every single book, right? Remember that every single marbled page in Stern's book was different at that point of time. There's no uniform uh, texture of color. So every story is different. The same story when it reaches you is different. When it reaches me is different. When it reaches someone else is different. Therefore, what have we actually covered? We've suggested that from 1650 onwards, storytelling faces a major challenge due to socioeconomic flux. We've suggested that this is also compounded by changes in print and readership. There are major challenges in terms of gender and the narrative subject. Catherine Gallagher, for example, suggests that the romance was always about somebody important. The novel is always about the nobody. So you knew narrative about the nobody, the nobody as a woman also. A consequent glut of narrative forms and approaches with the rise of naive empiricism and the questioning of this naive empiricism. An attempt also was made to create a bridge between the new province of writing and the more traditional forms of storytelling. And finally, around the middle of the 18th century, we witness a movement towards self Reflexivity, interrogating the modes of storytelling, be it covertly within the story by fielding or directly interrogating storytelling itself as Stern did. And this process of the romance, the empirical and the self-reflexive has been the story of the novel. You have realism establishing itself in the 19th century as the dominant form of storytelling. You have your Dickens, you have your Bronte sisters, and then a sudden challenge, a sudden crisis, fueled by philosophy, fueled by socioeconomic problems, and you have the modern. Therefore, very importantly, this is the this is the essential story of storytelling. Established practices, ossifications of practices, crisis of practices, self-reflexive introspection and storytelling, and the emergence of new practices. Very soon, realism will face its crisis in modernism. Modernist narrative will face its crisis in postmodernism and the story of storytelling goes on. At this point, when the 18th century was in its ascendancy, you have the first of these crises taking place. And it's therefore, I think, quite appropriate that this seminar begins at the beginning. I, I have seen some of the major uh, topics that my fellow speakers will be deliberating on. But this is the point where modern storytelling actually reaches its uh, you know, point of entry into very critical debates on the story, the storyteller, the audience, and the time and the context. That is all, more or less, that I had to offer. Uh, if you are interested, if you like this lecture, if you're interested in other lectures that I have given elsewhere and the courses that I teach, I teach more or less a wide variety of courses. They are available at my YouTube page, which is mentioned there. Should you like to take a look at them, please do visit. And thank you for your patience. And thanks to the organizers for providing me with this opportunity 
of interacting with you. It is with that that I bring this presentation to a close. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and uh, excellent work of research. And now I can understand why your dissertation was awarded by the government of India. Now, sir, your lecture was very much interesting and engrossing, and it has invited some questions from the participants. Now I am sharing the questions on the screen. Uh, yes, this is one question by Shamar Mukherjee. Uh, well, I do not really, did not really understand what he means by a little ice age. Uh, but I can assure you, Shamarpun, that many of you have read the 18th century as something of a static age, something which has very little flux. But this is when you see the beginnings of our modernity are established. Look around you. The institutes that you go to, the coffee house, the newspaper, the stock exchange, the rise of the woman as author, the birth of political uh, reason, philosophical reason, all of them are taking place from the 1650s to the 1800s. So no, I don't think this is an ice age at all. I think this is an age of great you know, flux. In fact, that was popularized by a man called Sainsbury who referred to the peace of the Augustans. No, this is not the peace of the Augustans at all. It's, it's an age which is fermented with debates where numerous questions of modernity are emerging, newer forms of, and therefore what happens is you have to tell these stories. You see, take the question of the woman, for example, which I'm sure Niladri will be discussing in a few uh, minutes. You see, you have this entire change in terms of marriage from the husband as lord to a, the notion of what Lawrence Stone has called a companionate marriage. Women's education, for example. How does one address them? So you need new narratives. You need new stories. And therefore, just think about the forms of storytelling that emerged. Prostitutes biographies, criminal biographies, newspapers, periodical essays, novels, diaries, autobiographies, religious literature. All these forms if emerge at the turn of the century. And it is these forms that then become the basis through which other forms are changed. So I think this is this period is a kind of a nucleus from where major forms of storytelling emerge. I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there is another question. Uh, yes. So there is another question. Yeah, I, 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 that's a good question in, in a certain sense. Because fundamentally, that question asks, when women write, uh, do they write differently? And yes, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. In fact, you know, this, this debate that women wrote what women liked to feel or felt. So this interiority that the, the interiority that the amatory fiction writers provide of the woman as a subject who feels desire and a woman who is capable of translating this felt desire into a potent form of narrative is where amatory fiction becomes, you know, a way of looking at feminine ecriture in the let, let uh, feminine ecriture is a is a critical concept. But there are moments where feminine ecriture has definitely been practiced, and I think we might read amatory fiction in those terms. So thank you for that question. But the more important question is, why did this stop? You see, to have the fathers of the novel, most of you have read your history of literatures. Where do you start? You start with a cursory mention of Afra Ben, who's now crept into the syllabus. But you have Defoe, Fielding, Stern, all of them 
men. And then you come to the more respectable woman novelist, Jane Austen, right? Who actually does not provide any ecritude feminine at all. But you see, the pattern of writing the history of the novel, the story of the novel has erased these mothers of the novel, as it were. So I agree with you there. Yes, sir, there is another question. Can stories, novels be therefore used as weapons to manipulate mind? Bojanto is a student of Vishwabharati. Yes, of course, Bojanto, it, it is. Uh, remember how, uh, if you've read, you are a young uh, a student, so you must have grown up on your staple of Harry Potter. And you see how, you know, uh, Dumbledore once talks about the stories that we tell to our children that very often uh, condition or fashion our uh, our selfhoods. You see this entire debate about the fairy tale where there's always the Rajkumar, as it were, who rescues the princess. And these are ways in which gender stereotypes are, uh, are you know, told. You, you have, for example, terrorist narratives which promise X, Y, Z uh, to people who become uh, martyrs, right? And therefore, their minds can be perverted. Does the novel free and at the same time stifle emotions and desires? Now, that is a question which has been asked by critics. That's a very good question, in fact. Now, there are two uh, figures uh, here. One, John Bender, who compares the novel and the story to a penitentiary, a prison, where you are brought and reformed. So if you're given stories of reform continuously, the suggestion is that your mind will be conditioned. Remember your Russo. Russo says that I will not allow Emil to read any storybook apart from Robinson Crusoe. So storytelling, yes, it contains. At the same time, the novel, as... Uh, as Terry Castle points out, is also the carnivalesque. And this is essentially the Janus face of the novel, as Bakhtin points out. The novel is polyphonic. So it, it and dialogic in the sense that it provides schema to many voices. So while there might be an effort to condition and contain, the novel always escapes the boundaries. Uh, and is written story more inclusive, flexible than oral stories? No. Not necessarily, not necessarily at all, because you remember that many of our epics, which are the most inclusive of stories, are oral narratives also. So uh, uh, I don't really think that, you know, uh, uh, that that is a very valid question, although uh, you will remember that oral stories, in fact, are uh, far more uh, dispersed, spoken across different classes. It might be the reverse, actually, that the oral story is much more inclusive than the written story. The written story is, after all, legible and readable only to a certain section of the people. But the oral story can be far more dispersed and far more inclusive uh, again. Right. So that's those three questions answered. I hope that answers uh, your curiosity. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and for uh, such a wonderful lecture and uh, thank you sir thank you sir. right thank you for all your questions and thanks to everybody who listened in and to the organizers with that i uh, seek your permission to sign off now so that the next speaker i'm sure is already present thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Hello, sir. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, welcome, sir, to our one day national level e conference organized by the Department of English, Seva Bharati Mahavid Dalai, and Gaurav Guin Memorial College. Dear participants, a story is not simply a fantastic work of imagination having nothing to do with the sordid reality of life. A story is essentially a cultural product. And hence, a story does not simply communicate message and information, 
it can also work as a potent tool for the dissemination of the ideologies of a particular community so a story may have a very important component may be a very important component to study the structure of power relations in a particular society beneath the aesthetic pleasure of a story lies the story of the politics of storytelling to explore this aspect of storytelling we have with us in this session a very eminent resource person professor niladri ranjan chatachi professor department of english university of kollani nodia west bengal professor chatachi has published extensively in the reputed national and international journals edited volumes and books he has more than 40 research articles and scholarly writings to his credit some of his remarkable publications include screening the nation guide and the reproduction of india a talent for the particular critical essay on arkan aryan edited by raymond fontaine and basudev chakraborty published by world view in 2011 the great little man the body as a structural motif in mulkraj anand's untouchable mulkraj anand untouchable long man study edition edited by nandini bhattacharya published by long man in 2007 flaws in the glass writing colonial masculinity australia and india convergences and divergences edited by santosh kumar sarin published in 2010 He has participated as a resource person in more than 100 seminars, conferences, symposia, and literature courses organized by the various Indian universities. His areas of interest include cultural studies and masculinity studies. He has more than 20 years of teaching and research experience. Professor uh, Chatterjee is a brilliant scholar and an excellent speaker. I had my opportunities to. Uh, listen to his lectures at several seminars organized by the department of english uh, vidyasagar university i ensure you that his lecture will definitely enlighten you and energize you with this i invite professor chatterjee to deliver his lecture please sir um thank you so much um, dr maiti for your very kind and rather elaborate introduction um can everybody hear me from where you are am i am i audible yes sir yes sir it's okay go on yes okay um again so thank you so much um the initially when i was asked to um speak at this particular seminar um i had uh, very quickly given uh, the title the politics of the narrative um and then i realized that maybe that is an extremely vague uh, and a very general um the topic uh, and if i wanted to talk about it i could probably talk about it uh, for the rest of the day so what i actually decided to do um, is is to narrow down uh, the particular topic um, and what i wish to talk about is something reasonably specific so um, of course politics is going to be a part of it um, politics of representation is going to be a part of it but it is actually going to be about the representation of of a particular kind of sexuality um which um you know is still not discussed as much as much as it uh, should be um i'm very grateful to uh, my previous speaker um uh, professor omrit shen um who uh, very very adroitly and very deftly um touched on the um sort of presence of sexuality um that one can find in the 18th century novel i think that is a very very important uh, point for all of us to remember the presence of sexuality that that uh, professor sen pointed out but uh, the the sexuality that is being talked about um you know in in novels traditionally has been heterosexuality so therefore there is only one kind of sexuality that has been talked about in which uh, there are always women involved so what i wish to do is to um, here talk about the way in which sexuality functions when there are no women so how does sexuality function when there are two or more men involved so what i really wish to do is um do a very very quick um run down as it were in the time that i have left 
um, a very quick rundown of the way in which homosexuality is represented in, in narratives and, and of course the politics of that representation. Now, if I have to start talking about the representation of homosexuality in literature, then of course one can actually go um, to uh, sort of, you know, uh, 300 BC um, or maybe even 200 BC. Um, so therefore we can go about two to 300 uh, years before the birth of Christ if one has to look at the representation of homosexuality in literature. So what I'm actually talking about is the way in which um, homosexuality was represented in Greek literature. Because every time we talk about Greek literature, the idea seems to be that, oh, Greek literature, ah, yes, of course, um, the Greek tragedy. Um, some of us may also be aware of uh, Greek comedies, yes? Um, so therefore, uh, some of us may certainly be aware of, of Plato, Aristotle, um, and that is about it. Not much discussion of sexuality in, in general and homosexuality in particular um, during, um, you know, these particular 300, 400 years before the birth of Christ generally happens in the classroom. Now, the whole point of organizing a seminar the whole point of organizing, as in this case, a webinar, is that we get to hear or we get to talk about things that maybe we normally don't get a chance to talk about in the classroom. So therefore, the things that I'm going to tell you um, need not necessarily be the things that, that we are going to uh, discuss in classrooms very often. So th this is a good opportunity for me. I can uh, talk about a lot of Greek literature where, where homosexuality is represented, but I shall only choose one particular text due to the shortage of time. And of course, the text is going to be Plato's Symposium, yes, which can be dated approximately to about 370 BC. Now, what is going on in Plato's Symposium? Now, this, I think, is a rather interesting point. Because um, something that we really have to keep in mind is the way in which um, very often in literature and indeed in popular culture and uh, society at large, sex very often masquerades um, or is gentrified, yes, rendered bhodro, as it were, through the disguise or through the mask of love. So therefore, there is a way in which, um, you know, I mean sex, but I say love. Yes. Uh, and it is this kind of, um, I am certainly going to call it a kind of hypocrisy, which we are so incredibly trained in. That so much so, when we have sex, we say that we are actually making love. So therefore, love is very often used to talk about sex. Now, the problem with that, and of course, it is a very big problem. The problem with that is that if you are going to constantly talk about sex, but use the term love, then what is basically happening is that sex is being romanticized. Sex is being sentimentalized and there is a politics in that because if you are going to sentimentalize sex if you are going to romanticize sex then ultimately it is going to be patriarchy that is going to win because then you can in a very strange way create a kind of a manichaean binary where you are going to say love is good and sex is bad so therefore, as long as I'm talking about love, it is wonderful and acceptable and beautiful. But if I, if I start to talk about sex, of course, then it automatically becomes very problematic. And the whole problem actually begins uh, actually in, uh, in, in, in Greek times because you must understand that um, homosexuality was uh, widely practiced um, in ancient Greece. It, it was regarded as being um, 
almost the rigor it it was almost regarded as being a very important part of greek culture uh, right so therefore what is really going on in ancient greece is that have um, you know open um, the practicing of of homosexuality but that homosexuality is constantly circulated in the name of love so therefore find in plato's symposium is a um, discussion of love yes that entire book is basically the discussion of love and what we really see is that uh, love is being talked about um uh, but of course we know very well that sex is involved in it as well but that is not something that is mentioned by name so what is happening in plato symposium well many of you are already familiar with this but for those of you who are not familiar uh, plato symposium is basically set at a banquet at which many great and good uh, of of ancient greek society they come in they congregate and at this dinner party which is what the symposium is they speak on a particular subject now on this occasion they speak on they speak on love everybody makes their speeches but of course the one speech that becomes very very famous the one speech that stands out is the one that is made by aristophanes now aristophanes basically says that love happened when um zeus got uh, was complained to by the other gods because humans were actually becoming very very powerful because at that time humans had four legs four arms and two heads that were back to back so therefore one could actually see behind oneself um so the humans were getting too powerful what so what zeus does is that he throws down a thunderbolt and of course the human bodies are sliced in half which is why today we have two legs two arms and one head so therefore uh, how happened well love happens because apparently um because our original body was separated we are constantly looking to unite with that other half so once we find that other half we cling on to that other half we don't let go and that according to aristotle is the way in which love happened that is how love was born all very romantic all very well except for the fact that in this particular story do you realize that um, the last time i checked love is actually supposed to be um, an emotional feeling right love is not supposed to be physical lust is physical love is not but when plato puts in this story and when he actually puts in the particular idea of two bodies being separated in this particular story of love he is also smuggling in sex so therefore plato is talking i mean through aris uh, through aristophanes plato is talking about sex but he is using the discourse of love to talk about sex so therefore this particular um, sort of uh, you know collapsing of 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 uh, love and sex it gets concretized right uh, and of course it still continues although plato the you know wrote this in 370 bc this very very toxic and very unhelpful collapsing of love and sex still continues because on 6th of september 2018 when homosexuality was decriminalized in india uh, many of you will know that the hashtag that started to do the rounds of facebook and instagram and whatsapp was love is love right so therefore it is very interesting how that hashtag love is love actually disguised what the verdict was about the verdict was not about love it was about sex but in newspaper after newspaper it all became all about love yes so therefore um so then that 
particular problem is something that we will be grappling with a little later. Anyway, we are talking about pre-Christian world. Of course, many of you will know that by the time Christianity happens, homosexuality is certified as a sin. And of course, um, very, very quickly, you have Christian nations around the world um, that and Abrahamic religions around the world, they basically start to criminalize homosexuality. I am going to skip several, several centuries um, and then I am going to hop, skip and jump very quickly onto the late 19th century. So that's a huge jump. Uh, but I'll, I'll come to the late 19th century because this is when what begins to happen is that there are some men who begin to start to ask for the decriminalization of homosexuality. Um, so this begins to happen and uh, there are a lot of people who begin to write um, about it. Um, you have got um, people in France who are writing about it. Um, and the person that I'm going to talk about um, is particularly important over here because he's a German writer. His name is Thomas Mann. Now, Thomas Mann, he published um, a novella called Death in Venice in 1912. So therefore, um, next year, we are actually going to be marking the centenary of the publication of Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. Now, what is it that happens in Death in Venice? Now, many of you will know that Thomas Mann, of course, uh, led a very interesting life in the sense that uh, to the public, um, he was married, he had children, well, he had several children, I think four or five. Um, but of course, secretly, he was a homosexual. He could only fall in love with men. Now, the important thing is that uh, men or boys, but the important thing is that whenever he fell in love, he never acted on it. So the, the strange thing about Thomas Mann is that whenever he fell in love, he wrote a novel about it. Instead of going up to the person as we are wont to do, um, you know, uh, to go up to the person and to say, excuse me, I think I love you, Thomas Mann would not do that. If he fell in love with somebody, he wrote a novel about it. So this particular novel, Death in Venice, is also based on an incident that happened in Thomas Mann's life when he, his brother, and his wife, the three of them, went to holiday in Venice, and Thomas Mann fell in love with this young boy um, who um, turns out to be this Polish aristocrat. But anyway, that's not important. What is important is that he fell in love with this boy and then out of the love for this boy came out this novel, Death in Venice. Now, what is it that happens in Death in Venice? Um, it is about uh, an author, much like Thomas Mann himself, although much older than Thomas Mann, because when he wrote Death in Venice, Thomas Mann himself was in his 30s. Um, but the, the character, Gustav von Aschenbach, in the novel is actually so shown to be, I think, um, the, perhaps in his 50s or 60s. So a lot older than, than what Thomas Mann was in, in real life at that time. So he falls in love with this boy uh, when he goes to Venice. And what happens is that there is a, an epidemic, much like uh, coronavirus, there is an epidemic that is, that is on the loose. Um, and ultimately, um, um, Gustav von Aschenbach contracts um, the virus and he actually dies of it. Now, when this novel was published in, 18, uh, in, in 1912, um, it was actually published in Germany, in, in German, uh, and it was subsequently translated and published in, in English a few years later. Remember that Thomas Mann was actually taking a very, very big risk, yes? because he was a respectable writer and he was writing fairly openly about homosexuality. But what we should remember is that um, there is a way in which this novel becomes popular for even homophobic readers, right? Because ultimately, at the end of the novel, the man who falls in love with the boy dies. So then it becomes very easy for the public to say, ah, see, this is what happened. 
if you are a man who falls in love with a boy you die yes so therefore uh, there is almost like um, a, a homophobic discourse um, that is a sort of built on <laughs> this particular novel which was not meant to be homophobic at all but this kind of homophobic discourse is something that uh, is still pretty prevalent you know um, i have had i have had reports in in some universities where this novel is taught um, i teach it myself um, at my university in the european literature course but i have had reports um, in in of of this novel being taught at other universities where this is basically what is said is that oh you know basically gustav von aschenbach dies of homosexuality um he doesn't uh, but that is the way in which our inherently homophobic academia presents this novel to the students so what we are actually looking at therefore is the way in which a novel um, that is entirely sympathetic towards homosexuality is through the politics of representation through the politics of of academic um, sort of activity begins to take on a certain color of homophobia um which which is something um, that a lot of people find very comfortable they think oh this is very good so therefore somehow they are going to um say that this is what it happens this is actually very very similar to uh, the way in which a lot of colleges um still teach uh, christopher marlowe's uh, play edward the second um because um the when edward the second is taught you know the the discourse seems to be ah well see you know the king died because uh, he fell in love with a with a man um the assumption seems to be that if he had fallen in love with a woman then everything would be fine now there is something that is happening at this time at exactly around this time also in england there you have em foster yes so em foster by that time is um again much like thomas mann's character gustav von aschenbach in in get in venice em foster is experiencing some kind of a writer's block now he's experiencing a writer's block and and he talks about it very openly he says that you know um, i mean openly in the sense that not 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 publicly but uh, but he certainly expresses this dissatisfaction because he says that i would have written a lot more he says because em foster is not known to be a particularly you know prolific novelist you know he's written very few novels um more very good uh, but they are not very many um so therefore em foster says that i could have written a lot more but the reason why i could not write a lot more is because there is um something inside me Uh, that prevents me from writing about the one thing that i really do want to write about which is of course men falling in love with each other so therefore what em foster um sets out to do um is that he actually does manage to write a novel and this novel is written so so um the thomas mann's death in venice is published in 1912 and the very next year 1913 um em foster starts to write his novel which is quickly um so that by 1914 um the novel is finished it is morris now morris is is a novel that em foster finishes writing but of course he has absolutely no intention of publishing it whatsoever because of course he knows that this is something that simply cannot be published because this is a, this is a frank novel about men falling in love with each other so he he says that you know i i can't possibly publish it he says that you know it 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 should be published only after he is dead yes so um another thing that i would another very important anniversary that i would wish to mention is that um this particular year that is to say 2021 is the 50th anniversary of the publication of morris because morris although was written in in 1913 1914 but it was actually published the year after the imposter died the imposter died in 1970 and morris was published in 1971 
Now, although Morris was written around the time of death in Venice, there is something radically different about Morris. And what is it? Um, again, the politics of the narrative, right? So therefore, um, in death in Venice, what happened? The protagonist died. Yes, the protagonist falls in love with a boy and he dies. What happens in Morris? The protagonist finds love and crucially, they live happily ever after. So therefore, E.M. Foster was absolutely determined that Morris should have a happy ending, the politics of the happy ending. When E.M. Foster finished writing the novel, when he actually showed it around to his friends, some of them liked it, some of them didn't. Um, there was one particular friend, um, this person many of you would be aware of because he is... Um, one of the most eminent prose writers um, of, of uh, the Bloomsbury group. His name is Lytton Strachey. Of course, many of you will know his work, The Eminent Victorians. Um, I think he probably also wrote a biography of Queen Victoria. But anyway, so, so he was very much part of the Bloomsbury group. Um, and E.M. Foster showed Lytton Strachey. Lytton Strachey himself was homosexual too. Um, E.M. Foster showed Lytton Strachey the novel and Lytton Strachey said, um, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't like it very much. So Ian Foster said, why, why don't you like it? And he said, I don't like it because um, in the novel, um, the, you know, ultimately the two men who fall in love with each other and who live happily ever after, such a relationship will not work in real life. To which Ian Foster says, um, yeah, okay, uh, but that is what fiction is about. And this is something that Ian Foster was very, very clear about. He said that, you know, if gay men, uh, well, of course, the term gay wasn't used at that time. It only began to be used in the 1950s or 60s. Um, but if, if homosexual men are not to have um, happy, sexually fulfilled, romantic lives in, in real life, they should at least have um, a happy, sexually fulfilled, um, emotionally fulfilling life in fiction. Because fiction allows you to do what real life does not. So Ian Foster says that I am absolutely determined that this kind of a happy ending. So therefore, the politics of the narrative, politics of the happy ending. So, so this was Ian Foster's politics. So there, there is an absolute politics in, in making sure that these two men fall in love and literally live happily ever after, like all the heteronormative fairy tales that we grow up on when we are children. But Lytton Strach is objecting something else. He said that, no, it is not about these two men finding happiness. It is that their happiness is absolutely impossible because the relationship, even in real life, would not work because they come from two different classes. Because the protagonist of Morris, that is to say the eponymous hero, Morris Hall, he belongs to the middle class. And his lover, uh, his companion, belongs to the working class. So therefore, there is a certain class distinction, which um, Lytton Strachey believed is absolutely unbridgeable. And no matter how much these two men love each other, this relationship will simply not work out because of the huge class difference. Be that as it may, this novel remained unpublished uh, for a very, very long time. And uh, E.M. Foster uh, despaired because he thought that, you know, homosexuality would probably never be decriminalized um, in England. But of course, E.M. Foster lived to see homosexuality being decriminalized because, of course, um, consensual homosexual intercourse between uh, men uh, who are adults was actually decriminalized in 1967. So uh, Ian Foster died, of course, um, three years later. So he definitely lived to see homosexuality being decriminalized, but he was still not very sure whether this novel should be published or not. And of course, it is published in 1971. So um, the two novels that are written, one in 1912, another in 1913, one ends in death and tragedy, another ends in life and happiness. Yes. 
so therefore um you know uh, while the public may find it very easy to accept um, death because uh, the homophobia that is ingrained in the public is going to say oh very good serve so this dirty old man right he should die um but um what he enforced was determined to do is to actually give it a happy ending of course by the time morris is published um the situation had changed in in europe um uh, situation was uh, certainly not um, quite that wonderful in india because in india of course people simply did not talk about homosexuality um and this is where before i go on to the 1980s i would very very quickly want to mention that it is in the 70s that you actually have a book published on homosexuality and that book called the world of homosexuals is published by somebody that many of you would actually know as a mathematician i am of course talking about shakuntala devi so it is shakuntala devi who actually publishes a book on homosexuality um in the 1970s many of you may have already seen um uh, the rather questionable <laughs> uh, biopic um starting with the uh, balan uh, which which is probably streaming in in some ott platform but uh, the, you know i can i can ask uh, questions about that particular incident later if if there are any questions but of course in india that discussion was not happening by the time we come to the 1980s and and much 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 more and more importantly by the time we come to the 21st century we realize that novels about homosexuality are becoming more and more um, in number they are being published more publishers are much more willing to publish them and what is interesting is that these novels are actually winning prizes so therefore there is a way in which um, a subject that em foster was um, scared to publish you know um, in in 1914 it is interesting that exactly 100 years later in 2014 you have a novel in which there is a graphic description of of gay sex um, namely a brief history of seven killings by marlon james that ends up winning the booker prize of course this is not the first time that a novel dealing with homosexuality deals the booker prize the first time that that had happened was of course it, uh, uh, 10 years before in 2004 when alan hollinghurst's novel the line of beauty won the nobel prize uh, i'm sorry uh, the booker prize and of course many of you may also already be aware that in 2020 that is to say the year that has just passed um uh, the booker winner was shagi ben and of course shagi ben is also written by a gay man and it deals with the life of of a gay boy um growing up in in scotland so what we really see therefore is that um there seems to be a certain change there seems to be um a certain acceptance of of novels that deal with homosexuality which has evolved over the last 100 years um but there is a way in which um you know in in the west the the gay novel um has uh, sort of gone over a very very dark period something that i have not talked about um, as yet but i don't have much time so maybe i should start to round up um the aids epidemic um so a, a lot of novels were produced during the aids um, epidemic those of you who are interested i can give you the names of these novels you can look them up um people like adam mars jones people like um andrew holleran people like edmund white um there there were a lot of felice picano so there were a lot of people who were writing uh, about about the aids epidemic um alan hollinghurst's first novel the swimming pool library was published in 1983 and it is just before the aids epidemic sort of bursts onto the international scene so therefore the swimming pool library with its sort of ashed celebration of gay sex is something that um it manages to be published just before the aids epidemic um sort of demonizes homosexuality in the public imagination all over again something that gay rights activists had taught uh, had fought so hard to to overcome 
So I shall very quickly end my um, rather uh, slipshod, um, quick survey um, of, of male homosexuality in, in English literature. I have not talked about, well, I mean, apart from um, the Death in Venice, all the novels that I've mentioned are, are originally written in English. Um, but this is just to tell you that um, this particular kind of fiction is something that we still don't talk about very often. And maybe we should, because not only is it about the politics of the narrative, that is to say how, um, uh, uh, you know, how a narrative is, is planned and what is the politics of that, but it is also about the politics of what narratives are circulated and what narratives are not circulated, right? So therefore, in at your, your syllabus, your, your college university syllabus, um, and, and if, you, if you can find um, any representation of homosexuality, that would be miraculous because um, even now, um, in, in 2020, 2021, we still don't have um, a, a syllabus that is sufficiently queer friendly. So, um, so a certain kind of heteronormative homophobic politics of the narrative still continues, and one could only wish that um, such politics um, comes to an end and we have a much more queer friendly, a much more um, sort of um, open, a much more uh, welcoming, celebratory politics um, of all sexualities in the years to come. Uh. Thank you, sir, for your uh, wonderful uh, lecture on the politics of narrative. Now, may I may I put, uh, put some questions? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yes, sir. This is one question by Shomarpan Mukherjee. Hmm. Yes. Oh, the Greek philosophers like Plato, Aristotle describe love in three forms normal, normally, eros, philia, and agape. Can you please elaborate on these three forms of love um, as described by the Greek? I think probably the question continues. Um, yes, of course, very, very quickly, very quickly, um, eros is the sexual part. So that is where love is regarded as, as sexual. Um, philia is, is the more uh, platonic, the more emotional love, but eros and philia, they are much, much more directed towards one person. But agape is, is a much more expansive love. It is, it is a much more, um, it is a much more communal love. So therefore, uh, love of a community, love of mankind, for example, Love that is not focused on any one person, that, but love includes everybody. So there is a kind of an expansiveness um, in, in this particular kind of love. Very interesting um, in this particular context, um, especially um, the, the difference between um, Eros and Dagape. Um, a, a very interesting poem uh, in this context might be W.H. Auden's poem, Lullaby. I would certainly recommend that you have it. Because that is where, the, again, another gay man. Um, because in, uh, in W. H. Auden's poem, Lullaby, what he's actually talking about is um, him being unfaithful to, to um, his boyfriend. Um, the, uh, a relationship is, is ending. It's a remarkable poem about a relationship um, that is coming to an end. Um, but, but Auden says that, you know, I, yes, this relationship is coming to an end, but I certainly encourage you to, to uh, love other people, to, to go out uh, and meet other people, and to spread your love. So therefore, when he talks about spreading the love, um, what is interestingly happening is that um, love that was erotic, uh, love that was about eros, becomes agape. It, it becomes much more expansive. It becomes, there is not much jealousy. There is no sense of ownership. There isn't, you know, the lover does not become the, the beloved's property or vice versa. Then it is it is a very expansive love. Um, so so these are broadly speaking the the differences amongst the three. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, yes, sir. There is another question. Uh, do you think, as a reader in modern, um, do you think in as a reader in modern days there are a lot of people who are absolutely fine accepting homosexual but do not choose to read homosexual novel? If yes, I well. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm, I'm not terribly sure uh, how um, accepting people are um, about, about homosexuality. I certainly would have my reservations uh, about um, making such a comment. Um, why don't they want to read about it? I think they don't want to read about it because it is very, you see, because reading um, involves a sustained engagement, right? Reading involves a deeper engagement, a more sustained, um, a much more um, sort of granular engagement with the issue. It is all very well to say, yeah, yeah, I've got no problems with homosexual people. They're fine. Now, to say that, it takes, um, you know, a few seconds. Uh, once you say, are you in support of homosexuality? Yeah. That takes one second. So once you said, I I'm in support of homosexuality, you don't have to deal with it anymore. You don't have to think about it anymore. But when you are having to read it, then you're having to think about it. You're having to think about it in great depth. It is too much work. We are, most of us, fairly lazy. Thank you for your question. Uh, so there is another question by Shopna yeah. Sagar, a student from yes. our college. Yes. Um, how does Oscar Wilde's extreme uh, homoerotic text uh, push the boundaries of the Victorian literature? Um, I, uh, okay, now Oscar Wilde's um, the homoerotic text, see the thing about Oscar Wilde is that um, his texts are not overtly homoerotic, you know, um, they are sort of couched in, in a very careful language. Oscar Wilde would not have had his sexuality exposed had he not been stupid enough um, to take the father of his, of his boyfriend, um, Lord Alfred Douglas, the Marquis of Queensbury, to court. Had Oscar Wilde kept quiet about it, he would not have gone to jail. So his, his fiction is very coded. I mean, if you look at the picture of Dorian, it is all about worshipping youthful male beauty. But, but there is no implication of homoeroticism, of course. I mean, if you read it now, which is very clear uh, exactly what kind of a person Lord Henry Wotton is, it becomes very clear what kind of a person you know, the artist is. Um, but it is not very clear. Um, Oscar Wilde's, uh, there is one novel which is reputed, I mean, it is attributed to Oscar Wilde, but never, one is never entirely sure. That is very graphic, um, graphic description of, of, of gay sex, which is Eleni. Um, But that is something for which Oscar Wilde never actually, he never claimed that novel to, to, be, to be his own. Um, so therefore, to, in answer to your question, his uh, texts are not extremely homoerotic. They are mildly homoerotic because they are couched in a certain kind of language. Um, but of course, what one has to understand is that at this time, there is a huge um, kind of um, network uh, of rent boys uh, who are functioning, who are making a lot of money in Victorian England. But somehow that does not get written about. Um, so, so that is an answer to your question. But yeah, I mean, but do look up um, the novel Teleni by, I mean, that is reputed to be by Oscar Wilde, but he never actually acknowledges it. So that might be an interesting text to look at. So thank you, uh, Shopra Yes, sir. So, uh, there is another question from Sapna Sagar. Yes. Um, since the sexual revolution is very rhetoric, okay, to the civil rights movement, should one differentiate between gender identity and sexual identity? Well, um, uh, yes, of course. I mean, I think gender identity and sexual identity are certainly different um, because your sexuality is not tied to your gender, although that patriarchy presents it. Um, so, yes, of course, it is different. Um, but I think the sexual revolution, you must understand that, um, you know, in, in other webinars, I have talked about it that um, a lot of the um, sort of when the sexual revolution began to happen, it was being led not only by feminists, um, but, uh, but a lot of lesbians also took part in it. Um, so, um, and of course, later on, the LGBT uh, community also becomes involved. Um, a lot of LGBT um, persons were also involved in the civil rights movement. Um, so something that we simply don't talk about enough is that these movements, um, 
whether it be the feminist movement or whether it be the civil rights movement or whether it be the lgbt movement there was a lot of cross fertilization that happened a lot of cross fertilization they were constantly borrowing political strategies from each other they were constantly comparing notes they were having meetings there was a lot of to and fro going on amongst these movements which we simply don't talk about so therefore there was a lot of intersectionality that is going on um so so while uh, gender identity and sexual identity are certainly different but um but uh, those who are uh, those who were supporting or those who were advocating gay rights certainly threw in their lot um with with those who were advocating women's rights and those who were advocating civil therefore there were points at which these movements converged um but of course as as um, as lived reality yes of course gender identity is different from sexual identity but that's a wonderful question by the way thank you thank you sir thank you for accepting our invitation and for such a wonderful uh, lecture and for giving us time thank you sir thank you thank you so much thank you Uh, welcome, sir, to our one-day national level e-conference organized by the Department of English, Seva Bharati Mahatidala, and the Department of English, Gurub Gwin Memorial College. Now, <coughs> uh, dear participants, while talking about the changing patterns of storytelling in the British fictions, we should not forget that India is a rich treasure house of folk tales, fables, myths, and legends. the ramayana and the mahabharata are the living examples of the great indian tradition of storytelling apart from these two epics there are innumerable collections of tales in many indian languages and india is the birthplace of many remarkable storytellers to explore the grand tradition of storytelling in hindi we have with us in this technical session professor akshay kumar professor department of english and cultural studies punjab university chandigarh uh professor akshay kumar has more than 30 years of post graduate teaching and research experience under his supervision 28 scholars have been awarded with mphil degrees and 15 scholars have been awarded with phd degrees his areas of interest include comparative indian literature translation studies and contemporary literary and cultural theory he has edited two books the first is cultural studies in india essays on history politics and literature edited by rana nayar uspinder sayal and akshay kumar published in 2016 uh, by rootledge the second one is dialogues across languages theory and practice of translation in india edited by uspinder sayal rana nayar and akshay kumar he has also authored two books the first one is poetry politics and culture Indian context and contexts published in 2009 by Rutledge and the second one is A K Ramanujan in profile and fragment published in 2004 by Rawat he has widely published research articles book reviews in many reputed national and international journals he has been a reviewer in Rutledge Taylor and Francis group digital scholarship in the humanities oxford academic journal Sahitya Akademi Translation Awards, uh, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies Simla, I A C L A L S Journal, Dialogue, Indra Prastha Journal, G G S University Delhi. He has presented more than seventy papers in conferences, seminars, workshops. He has he was awarded major research project on the topic mapping Indianness. a comparative study of hindi punjabi and indian english poetry by the university grants commission in 1999 he has completed his major research project on the topic mapping indian popular culture jokes cricket and popular hindi cinema in 2007 to 2009 he was awarded with associate fellowship at iias simla he held a number of administrative positions at various stages of his academic career he was the dean faculty of languages punjab university chandigarh in 2017 and 18 
He was the fellow Punjab University Senate for the years 2011-12 and 2015-16. He was the member of Governance Reform uh, Reforms Committee, Punjab University, Chandigarh, in 2016 to 18. He was the member of IQSC, Punjab University, Chandigarh. He was the coordinator, uh, Chandigarh Social Science Congress in 2018. He is also the research person of UGC, HRTC, Academic Staff College for Delhi University, uh, GNDU Amritsar, Punjab University, Patiala, MDU Rohtak, BPS University, Kanpur, Kurukhetri University, and Punjab University, Chandigarh. Professor Akshay Kumar had been thus a dynamic academician with numerous accomplishments. Recently, I participated in the refresher course in Kurukhetri University, and I had the opportunity to listen to his lecture, and I was very much impressed by his lecture. I'm sure you will be very much impressed by his profound scholarship and brilliant skill of presentation. With this very short introduction, I welcome and invite Professor Akshay Kumar to kindly begin his address. Sir, please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Sumit Kumar. Well, it was not a brief introduction. I think you left every, you, you you said everything, with, even the avoidable things you said. Okay. Uh, I would be talking about uh, not exactly the the story of the story of Hindi telling in this short story because I'll, my my focus would be on on its rather should I say subtle role in shaping the Hindi sensibility and 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 making this sensibility far more should I say progressive and 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 to that extent secular and and a sensibility which which is always uh, in, in a process of becoming a sensibility which struggles with itself and a sensibility which is always in a mood of dialogue. So short story in Hindi, you know, I, I always, you know, of course, Samit referred to fables and other mythical tales and legends. Well, I'm talking about the modern short story. And and this modern short story is a is placed as it is in this Hindi heartland has a has a challenge. And the challenge is because this this heartland has is so as is steeped in this mythical consciousness in the in the in this kind of a so to say theological consciousness to forge a, a some kind of a secular narrative secular short short fiction and in in, in a framework which is a framework of questioning in a framework of perhaps maybe protest because short story modern short story is not a short story of easy so to say allegorical you know allegorical statements or allegorical narratives this this short story is a short story which is always at war which, is, which i'm using a very extreme but not war but i'd say always in in some kind of a feverish negotiation with the with this, you know, overtly religious, ritualistic, traditional Hindi heartland. So this short story, I see this, this if you if you ask me, the story of Hindi short stories is a story of perpetual negotiation with this dominant tradition dominant tradition or traditions of the hindi heartland a story that this is a story of of you know incremental so to say awareness a story that 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 always launches its small struggle against the monolith of tradition whether I'm, I'm not saying this short story is a is is going to displace the tradition i'm not saying that this short story in this short story has been able to to undo the the 
excesses of tradition or that it has been able to reverse the tide of tradition to that to that to that extent i'm looking at this story as, a, as 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 not as a fable not as a parable not as a, not an, as, as an allegory but a story of human experience of lived experience which often you know has 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 a has a has a has a has a, has a, has a very different kind of a role to play in the sense that this this experience is is experience of modification experience of of some kind of a you know progressive onward thinking the the so when you look at hindi short story in modern hindi short story it is to to a great to a, to to a great extent this short story is, is not a, sto a story of loud uh, so to say finales or, or or a story of very precise resolutions this is a story which is uh, hindi short story is a, so, is a is a short story of you know of the backyard of the of the hindi heartland's backyard it it it's a story it, it's a, it's a short story uh, that goes into the into the by lanes and the in the back lanes of which of hindi heartland which are which are noisy which are very garrulous but this short story hindi short story uh, as i could as i i i mean if you look at all the great stories that we have i mean none of their number of anthologies which 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 are available in translation now which actually uh, give you some kind of a you know i would say comprehensive view or i won't call it synoptic but comprehensive view of hindi short stories engagement with the back lanes of hindi heartland and the and 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 the and the unsaid narratives of hindi heartland these narratives are are the narratives which talk about that which 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 also in a way form a counter culture a kind of a Uh, uh, an alternative culture uh, again uh, these are uh, you know terms which are given by western theory i would i would not really vouch for them to that extent but i'm using for 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 sake of convenience here because these when i say counter culture when i say alternative culture not not in an in a, in, a, in an oppositional way hindi short story is not a discourse of opposition of vertical opposition of frontal opposition hindi short story is a discourse of you know as a said clever intelligent negotiation where you accept tradition at the same time also cause some rupture in the tradition and that's how i look at the at the at the tradition of hindi short story i'm saying this because already we have realized you know <clears throat> that in fact uh, i had given a title to my talk that this is a a very non prescriptive a descriptive kind of ethical idealism that this short story becomes a locus of short story placed as it is in a, in a, in this dominant hindi heartland in this dominant hindi heartland dominant of course it is dominant because of its 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 presence its size but also because of its inherently you know mythical you know landscape to that extent so this short this hindi short story i'm talking about modern short story if it has to say something if it has to even reiterate a moral if it has to say if, if even if it has to say express its its romantic impulse or its progressive you know so to say sentiment it would always say it through a narrative framework a narrative framework which is a framework of of as i said narrative in a way i would say defer i would not i would it it moderates its anger narrative in a way gives it a give give this 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 hindi 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 short story that that kind of an indirection which is required to to express a working moral not an absolute moral 
for me this this hindi short story offers you a framework of self reflexive morality morality which is at work with itself a morality which is which is which which always is open ended a morality which 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 is more descriptive than prescriptive a morality which 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 in a way stops short of being loud declamatory so uh, i mean whatever the impulse whether it's the progressive impulse whether it is the 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 romantic impulse or 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 or, or any or even realist impulse short story even the even this these 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 hindi modern short story i'm i'm, I'm talking i'm referring to short stories from you know pre premchand to post premchand to modern short story writers you know one can go manu bhandari and shivani and and lot many sara rai and many many other new new writers of the new generation if there's one thing that defines the journey of hindi short story it is this 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 understated and rather subtle morality of this of of, of their narrative of the of the or or should i say this the journey is defined by its quest quest to question the given and therefore you can almost parallel you can almost draw a parallel between the 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 history of hindi short story with the history of the hindi heartland in the sense that this is a heartland where morals ethical ideals mythical so to say ordeals are a for grounded at the same time displaced in a framework of negotiation in a framework of eternal dialogue let me begin with a with a i don't know whether these prefatory remarks would help you but it, let me give you two three instances for instance i was this one story which which almost has acquired kind of a canonical status Uh, this is written by chandradhar sharma guleri who just wrote three four stories and he was a writer from punjab he wrote a sto- short story about you know it is said usne kaha tha which is to say that there, that there is a there is a character here and she had said something and the story is based on what what the character had said in this in this in this story by chandradhar sharma guleri the setting is that of the world war but before it actually goes to the to the sites of bunkers in the world war it actually begins in a by lane of a village a small encounter between two young i would say rather two young not even teenagers a young boy accidentally runs into a young girl and he rescues the girl from being trampled by a tanga a horse driven cart and there is some kind of you know uh, you you can call it some kind of a uh, love at first sight which is again a very uh, should i say but the story is is, is 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 doesn't say it as much because the, remember it is it is placed in a in a hindi context is placed in a context in north indian context where Uh, there is some kind of a vibe exchange of vibes between the two young girl and a young boy and once or twice these they meet and and the boy happens to ask the young girl that have you been engaged it betroth the word is kudmai that means in hindi it is called sagai that have you been engaged with have you have you been betroth to someone and the girl shy as she is she runs away and she says and she doesn't say and she just walks out she runs away later on much later on and there is no there is no further encounter of the boy and the girl the story takes the shift and the, 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 the now it goes to the to the war front world war 1 where lena singh the name of the boy is lena singh 
and there is a he he has a subedar with him whose name is Vajira Singh. And you know, in, in in when you are when you are guarding a bunker in a very difficult in different in a very difficult kind of a hostile environment, you know, the, every moment is a moment of life and death. Vajira Singh actually you know, has has this fear of death. Both Vajira. So one day when Vajira Singh uh, goes back to his village and Lana Singh is also invited to his village. He finds Vajira's wife is happens to be the same girl which he had met in his childhood and had small time infatuation, so to say, with her. And when that girl finds that Lana Singh is a kind of a bunker mate of Vajira Singh at, at world, in, in, the, in the World War, he takes a promise from Lana Singh that you will guard Subedar no matter what the challenge is. This is just a kind of a Subedarni who now is not in any way linked to Lana Singh. The only link is that Subedarni when she was unmarried and Lana Singh when, when he was unmarried and both were, you know, you know, not even teenagers, both were children. They just that 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 informal link that they had, that informal so to say eye to eye communication that they had at that point time that now becomes a full communication and and subedarni says that you will guard my husband and you know the story in the story lana singh actually sacrifices his life to safeguard vajira singh the subedar the husband of that small girl which he had met in his childhood and why 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 should he Say Vajira Singh, and why should he sacrifice his own life? The only thing they say is this because she had said so. Usne kaha tha. That 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 Suvadarni had taken this promise from him. Now this is a very, you know, I would say a romantic tale of a different order altogether. What kind of romantic tale is this? This is a feeling of romance, which is a you know very strange feeling of romance. Maybe because Three, two, three meetings in the beginning, in at, at, at an age when you don't, when when both are, you know, I've said underage kids had that kind of a small time love affair. I mean, these are languages; these are terms which I'm, I'm using from a different register. May not be true in that context. And that kind of association, which was informal, but very intimate, deeply intimate, and this Lena Singh gives up, gives up his life in order to celebrate, in order to honor that intimacy of his childhood love. Or that childhood experience. The point which I am making here is, even when it comes to expressing romanticism in Hindi, in, in the short story, and why Usne Kahata and this story by Guleri is supposed to be a milestone, because you know the the romantic sentiment is also conveyed within the the corset of what is called maryada what is called some kind of dignity some kind of you know some kind of a you know as i said rarefied informal ethical protocol the point which i am making here is that this is a different kind of a I would say template of, of, of a romantic tale. Just because Subedarni and asks him, Lana Singh, to protect the life of her husband, Lana Singh gives up his life. 
so what the point which i make is the morality operates in hindi hindi short story but this is a morality which is morality which is very of a, of of not prescriptive nature morality where you know what is what is moral in hindi literature is not what is prescribed or codified in any scriptural text morality is what transpires between two individuals morality is what 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 actually is 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 an inner inner call a childhood memory a childhood a cherished memory of a, of a childhood love even that becomes a moral touchstone hindi short story has always moved along this kind of intimate morality not morality intimate and i said non prescriptive morality it is not written anywhere in the traditional discourse that a young boy would safeguard the, hus the husband of his erstwhile i would say lover again not lover to that extent because this love love lover kind of a thing is not valid in this context but yet for want of word we will use this this kind of language for want of adequate language the point which i am i'm trying to hammer here is this that constant you will find hindi short story creates spins each short story i'm talking about each short story creates a new kind of a moral configuration there is a short story by yashpal another formidable hindi fiction writer he was a he was a marxist but his short um, there are many stories but this i'm i'm referring to this very small uh, story called phulo phulo is the name of a young girl again very young girl phulo's kurta phulo's shirt phulo is a young girl very young girl i mean when i say young girl is i would say even even young here would mean in the age bracket of 7 or 8 years and you know in the traditional hindi heartland and in, in many pockets even now many children are married at this age and she is just a small girl who who is a girl from very low income group kind of a family i mean they they are they just keep they are just street urchins kind of you know they they play in the street half naked kind of a thing and she he is she is betrothed once again to a to a young boy of of the same age group perhaps and then one day i mean as they are playing in the street this young girl whose name is phulo happens to go to the street of his of her prospective in laws this young girl phulo who is now betrothed to a young boy and both are you know just maybe i am using the word street urchin which is perhaps is not the correct word they they are they are the almost garbage pickers kind of a thing you know they are not they are not well off and this girl phulo is dressed in a long kurta long shirt this girl is dressed in a long shirt and because she has seen the ladies of her of of her house whenever they go and meet their in-laws or when they happen to meet in-laws they will try to cover their head and they will try to cover or hide their face you know as a matter of sort of a social protocol of paying respect to the elders of the male elders and this is the in the heartlands common practice when she lands up in that street of the in-laws and when she because she had seen that ladies in her house that often do you know 
often observe a practice. She also lifts her kurta and tries to cover her head. But she doesn't realize that there's she is she is she she doesn't she doesn't have to, you know she she has she is naked down below her waist. She is she, she does because kids are kids after all. I mean they there are they are semi naked kids. They they walk around. And as she lifts the kid, as she lifts her kurta to hide her head, and not not because she has been instructed, not because she was told to do so, because she had seen that ladies in her house often do when they meet happen to meet male elders of the in-laws family and in the process she exposes her naked you know lower half the the other street kids begin to laugh she is not able to make out why are they laughing but she because as she lifts the kurta and covers her face with it Her nakedness becomes a butt of ridicule there. Now Yashpal, when he when he writes his story, he makes a very terse comment, and this that terse comment towards the end. I mean, normally in short stories, you have some very, you know, I would say, some kind of a normally stories don't most of the Hindi stories don't have these kind of easy resolutions. But this story gives you some kind of a, a parting comment. And the comment I'm, I'm reading here, he says, this is what happens when even in changing times, you try to protect morality and modesty with established traditions. Let me read this line once again. This is what happens when even in changing times, you try to protect mor morality and modesty with established traditions. So. You know, and this is the best thing about Hindi short story is that it offers that niggling critique of the monolithic traditions from inside by staying within the within the rubric of that tradition. So here in this story, once again, as I said, that there is modesty on the one hand and there is that tradition on the one hand. And as she protects modesty with established tradition, she, 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 she only ends up showing her nakedness, the small child, full of as, as she is. Now for me, this short story, and you know, this is indeed a very short story. This 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 kind of a very I would say mini narrative in a way points out towards the inner struggles of Hindi's heartland, the inner quarrels of the Hindi heartland. This 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 becomes for me a short story is a I've told you is 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 not a narrative of flat. A didactic message. It's a story of it, it's a it's a it's a locus of 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 some kind of a inner quarrel. A, a, a locus of some kind of you know tension within. And And as, I, as I said, each short story, each short story is aimed at, and this is a this is an uneven fight, you might call it. This is un, short stories are not epics. They, 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 don't, they, they don't take on, you know, they don't take on grand narratives of tradition with, with some kind of a, uh, you know, you know, on, on a mega scale. These short stories are, you know, honest small attempts very sincere attempts at you know chiseling the edges chiseling the rough edges of of the tradition and creating within the tradition 
a very hospitable space, a space of coexistence, a space of some kind of, you know, as I said, space of survival. Because no short story, modern short story, particularly in Hindi, except tradition as it is. Let me refer to, uh, of course, uh, how can one give a talk on Hindi short story and without referring to Munshi Premchand, I mean, who is uh, one of the stalwarts of Hindi short story. And the number of stories, you know, each story. Uh, Hindi short story is, in a discussion of Hindi short story with Munshi Premchand is just like talking about Indian record without Sachin Tendulkar. I don't know whether this analogy is, is fair or not. I would say rather a little too frivolous. But OK. Or, or let me give you a better analogy that it is just like discussing Indian politics without, uh, without Mahatma Gandhi. So in this, uh, uh, let me refer to it. Num of course, there are a number of stories. But, but the story that comes to my mind is, uh, which is a story uh, which is, again, I said, often travels in all, all world in anthologies of, of short stories. Uh, Kafan, which often translated as Shroud also at times. In this short story, which is a, uh, there is a, the setting is of a low caste family in which a woman is in, in labor pains and, and there is a father-in-law and there is a husband. And the family is, as I said, is, is not only poor, but it, it, the family is, is absolute. There is an abject poverty. And they don't have money enough to garner funds to arrange for a last rites. Kafan. Kafan is the last shroud, that, that white sheet. And the lady dies. Both the father-in-law and the husband bewail. And they and and the village, the, the, the villagers, they undertake the responsibility. They say, well, they arrange funds for them and they say, okay, we give you money, you buy kafan for her, buy shroud for her. Because the two father and son duo. Some people say that they were idle, they were, they, they were, they were shakar. Some people say they did not have land, they did not have any opportunity to work. So the money that is arranged to for a, for a shroud by the villagers, they they feel that that they they use this money for some other purposes. The purpose is they go to the market, or the well, market is another. I'm not saying market, but to the to a perhaps a village shop where you have a halwai who's, who makes some kind of puris and jalebis and other small time mod morning breakfast stuff. Because they had seen money for the first time and, and money in, of this denomination. Yeah, I think I'm back. Is, is that all right? Yeah, yes, sir. Sorry, there was, yeah, there was some disconnection. I'm back. Okay. So they go and ask for these puris and halwas and other things, small delicacies, small time delicacies of, of a village life. And they order so much that they can't even consume. This is what happens to a to, to somebody who has never seen money. This is a, this is what happens to somebody who has never seen who, who has lived his life at the level of abject poverty. And they take this this 
they 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 take this small you know small delicacies and even offer the leftovers to the dogs with some sense of you know some kind of flamboyance that today that we have become so rich that we can offer even to the dogs the leftovers they become forgetful of the fact that there is a there is a there is a dead body in the house and that that body has to be cremated they just become forgetful about that and they begin to revel in the money that is arranged for the kafan for the last rite kafan is supposed to be one of the great stories of uh, greatest uh, one of the greatest stories of in the uh, in the in, in modern times now again this short story you, you try to understand you know the of course premchand has written very other social like thakur kumar where you know there is this he would talk about the caste oppression and how how the village thakur would would not allow the lower caste people to take water from the well but in in this story of uh, which i refer to kafan here particularly look at this is a story which is deeply steeped in some kind of a social reality this is a story that that you know i've told you this social realism in hindi literature or realism of hindi short story is not realism without any direction the realism is is not just a simple exercise of faithful mimeticism here this realism is an exercise of taking a dig at at the real at the real life this realism is is aimed at un uncovering the hypocrisies of of social life the in in inequalities of social life so this realism acquires that kind of instrumentality this this realism and it have there is this the ethical quotient of hindi short story is available only you know is available to to a very sensitive reader this is this is this is not overtly said and and that perhaps we happen this this perhaps this this largely happens because narrative narrative intervenes narrative creates that kind of a you know space of negotiation narrative has this role in hindi short story as a narrative uh, 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 the, the 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 canvas of hindi short story offers that kind of a indirection necessary indirection and perhaps i would i would say moderation look at now look kafan is you look at this there are many things one can one can draw from this short story one is that that indian society you know look at this you know, one is that the levels of object poverty the caste discrimination of course there are many readings of this 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 story i'm not going into all those readings here all i'm trying to suggest to you is with each story written by particularly by these great masters you will find the social structure of hindi and when i say social structure you know it is very fairly stratified this social structure is i won't say undone or or or, or demolished with a revolutionary fervor that that would be too much that would be putting too much of a premium on on the potencies of hindi short story or any short story for that matter they are not they are not trying they, but they create a mini challenge they create a, a, a very as i said a challenge from below which you never know and, and as as we move forward as we move forward in the in the age of dalit short story later on you find that the 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 murmurings the the short story i take as a murmur as a as a murmur of dissent and this ossifies this ossifies into into some kind some kind of a visible social change later on today if the dalit movement in india has 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 taken some some shape or perhaps is still perhaps or might in in the state of in the state still still in the shape of in the process of taking some shape 
It's largely because such stories have gone into the making of this kind of a consciousness. Of course, people, there are critics who would say that sorry, portrays Dalits in a, in a bad light, they, they are shown socially irresponsible, that they are too cavalier and that they and that they 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 enjoy while the dead body is is languishing in the or, or perhaps is rotting in the in the house. But these are, I would say, intellectualized readings of this of the short story. But my point here today is as I'm trying to that how each short story creates a, a moral edifice, a very, a very small, not they're not creating when I say small, I'm not, they're not creating grand structures of morality here. The short, the short story writers, each short story is, is, is as I've told you, is, is I, I can give you a number of other stories. One, let me uh, come to this very famous story by uh, Rajendra Yadav, where Lakshmi is held captive. Where Lakshmi is held captive, Rajendra Yadav, one who started, one who edited very famous Hindi journal called Hans, supposed to be one of the canonical journals and which promoted many writers and which saw the rise of, which which actually in a way was one of the sought after Hindi little magazine, which promoted many young talent, young writers. In this short story where Lakshmi is held captive, you know, suddenly, you know, there, this is a story about Lakshmi and Lakshmi, you know, was Vishnu's wife. And but, but here, Lakshmi, Lakshmi is actually the name of a of a young girl. And there is this this trader Govind, and he thinks that you know he he ever since this girl is born in this in this house, Govind's business begins to boom in, in that sense. It begins to take a good turn, a turn for the for the better. But later on, you know, and edit and when when Lakshmi grows younger, there is this concern for marriage. And her horos horoscope is seen by some uh, family astrologer or or a pandit. And he says that as long as this girl is in this fam family, your business is going to boom. As long as your daughter is in this family, your your your, fa your business will. The day this daughter leaves this house, the business would collapse. Would you believe it? Here is a father. In order to ensure the his trade and his flourishing trade, he refuses to marry Lakshmi. And so much so that he, he ensures that Lakshmi also does not come in contact with any boy. Because as long as Lakshmi is in the house, his business, as the astrologer tells, is going to flourish. So Lakshmi is, is, is held captive throughout and, and the, the entire it's a, it's a story is about how that he 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 creates all kinds of obstacles in the way in the life of Lakshmi and Lakshmi is no is not anybody else's daughter. Lakshmi is Govind's her own his own daughter, but because this astrologer had said something, he ensures that she doesn't step out and she is held captive. I'm just trying to summarize these stories because. Uh, summarizing a short story is always a risky business. There are many, you know, there are many smaller distractions in the story which are equally very powerful. But I'm not recounting all of, all of them here. The point which I'm making here is this short story again talks about the oppression of the astrologer in the Hindi art land, particularly where where horoscope becomes. You know, almost kind of a of a, of, a, of a, a template of not only this life but of the previous life and the life thereafter. This short story, in in a, in a way, is is the you know caricaturizes Govin's desire to hold on to his business at the cost of the life of his own daughter. And in this in this particular you know context, you'll find it is what is what is 
Petrarchy is questioned. The, the selfish interests of Petrarchy are, 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 are uh, the self, selfish, self-preserving interests of Petrarchy are questioned. How daughters are treated, they, this is being questioned. And how, more importantly, this kind of this stranglehold of the orthodoxy. Believe me, these writers acquired some kind of status within in the art land, which is supposed to be orthodox, superstitious, conventional. If these writers acquire that kind of a status of the superstars of Hindi short story, you must accept that and we must accept that within Hindi heartland, the the protest, the literary short story as a as as, as a form of protest, does does make its headway and is accepted. The writers are accepted. Premchand is accepted by 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 people at large. He was a writer. He was a he was a he was writer of the people. These writers had such strong, you know, such strong constituencies of readership, and that shows that there is a there is within the Hindi heartland, there is this this large chunk of readers who who know how to laugh at themselves, who know how to how to question their own 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 mindset, which is otherwise deep deeply steeped in in conventions. I, I also refer to one more story by. Uh, this is a, a story written by, mm, let me refer to this story by a different story where, uh, let me just mention this story, just come to that. In this, in this short story, which is a, a atonement by Bhagavati Charan Varma. Again, one of the leading stalwarts of Hindi letters. In this short story, Atonement, you know, it so happens that the young daughter-in-law happens to kill a cat. And killing a cat is a bad omen. Is it is 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 supposed to be a kind of a you know something which which can invite disaster for the family. This is what the orthodox template is all. This is what the orthodox you know mindset is all about. This is what the orthodoxy would tell you that if you kill a cat, then you have to atone for it. And how do you atone? How do you atone? For that, you will have to go to the village pandit, to the to the to the village priest, because in the family I mean, there is a there is a huge crisis. The mother-in-law is very jittery; she feels very unsafe because the daughter-in-law has has killed or killed accidentally killed or killed intentionally killed, but killed a cat. And as they go to the pandit, pandit gives all kinds of you know solutions to atone for. And one solution that he gives is that the family will have to offer to, to, to the temple or to temple means to him in particularly a cat made of gold, a golden cat. If, if they do so, then perhaps the sin of the daughter-in-law and not only daughter-in-law but the entire family can possibly atone for. And the family doesn't have many resources. They take loan, they do all kinds of things to, to, to garner money so that they can make a cat of gold. And as they're struggling, and as 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 as, as this this village pandit is, you know, not only of course he, he demands for a gold a golden cat, he also, you know takes a heavy feast. He asks for not only feast for himself, but many other village bandits that he will have to give, arrange some feast for seven, eight, ten bandits. Suddenly, you know, as he's about to take away the golden cat, it so happens 
that the the cat which 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 the family thought had died she bounces back to life she had gone because the the the, the, the daughter in law had just thrown the cat out of the window and the cat was lying in a state of stupor and suddenly she wakes up and the cat walks away and this exposes the hypocrisy of the village pandit and and the duplicity of the brahminical order to, to that extent the point which i'm making here is that once again this short story you know to to say that hindi heart rate is, is superstitious is, is one observation this could be a, this could be an observation of a of, of somebody who looks looks at the the macro picture but there are narratives of this kind which also has said this is the, each this short story for me atonement is a is 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 a, is a story is is a manifesto of of, of a, a short story becomes a small time manifesto i won't say it's a loud manifesto a small time manifesto of of change of incremental change of a new ethics of an open ethics uh because of course there are many stories let me uh, towards the end count up a story which is manu bhandari is uh, one of the trishanku is a story where there is a young girl in a family and uh, it's 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 almost an autobiographical story and the mother is mother because she was uh, herself a kind of a i would say not victim but perhaps uh, who was at the receiving end of patriarchy mother's father was very orthodox and she did not allow uh, mother to in her in her youth to mix with boys and to to have her own freedom so she she realizes that if that her daughter would not suffer what she has suffered and she allows her daughter that sense of freedom that gives that 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 kind of freedom and she in fact allows the daughter to mix with boys in fact she calls the boys herself in the family so that they mix with they have some kind of a dialogue with them and that kind of an open environment the mother is trying to create mother being an academic here she realizes that daughter need should should not be protected should not be given that much of a you know secure environment so so to say whether it is secure insecure one never, one never knows but she she is an open open minded mother she is a modern mother to that extent and she invites even the 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 boys the classmates and the and the street mates to the home also and 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 she she is allowed to play with them she allows to mix with them she she even allowed to go to their residences but towards as as this this freedom the, the girl begins to enjoy and she begins to actually develop a thinking for some boy and 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 when suddenly the mother thinks that the, the girl has taken uh, too much of a freedom and she has become too much liberal and that she is she is going against the family norm and then she begins to assert herself that you can't do this beyond a point you can't stay at at, at you know during the night with some boy at the end of the street this is not done we we have allowed you this this liberty we have given you this freedom to mix with boy but that doesn't mean that you stay overnight with boys you know to to this extent and and the daughter is confused at the at the conduct of the mother that how come mother is mother who was who was otherwise so liberal and so open and and she allows she has allowed me to grow the way i have been allowed to grow suddenly she becomes so so conventional and she become be, begins to act like uh, her her father but i am reading this 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 story uh, this last line of the story but how can one fight with mummy who's nana one second and mummy the next because the mummy is also the mother is under also going undergoing some kind of a fluctuation some kind she had becomes nana the, 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 the that she begins to behave like her own father and at the same time she begins to behave like a liberal mother this exactly this conflict is the conflict of hindi short story and this is where it resides this is where it flourishes this is where it finds its its relevance a short story which is which is trapped which is which is i would say thankfully trapped in 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 these kind of contradictory pulls where the one pull is that of the nana the other pull is of the mother nana wants is conventional mother is modern minded and daughter is is tossed between the two this 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 
this this kind of a fluctuation is a happy fluctuation this actually to me is in is is the is the locus of what i call non descriptive non prescriptive ethical idealism i think i'll end on this note maybe i'll invite some questions uh thank you sir for your brilliant presentation and you have rightly presented a very unconventional uh, mode of uh, representation of morality in the in, in the in the short stories now sir some questions there are from the participants yes uh, of course i said i, I already i have meant uh, this, is, uh, this is a question from Swap swapna sagar he says as you said certain indian traditions and certain indian short stories don't go hand in hand can we say they were written to break i would not enter into this kind of a i would say violent kind of a uh, uh, you know so this is a, to me this this looks you know go they go i would say they don't go they go hand in hand with them but they i would say they would break it's a i would my my term which i've used repeatedly uh, uh, is that this is an intelligent negotiation this is an intelligent negotiation how do you how do you you know create room of habitable hospitable existence within the with, within a within a within a framework of very rigid morality not by breaking it not by by creating an oppositional discourse by by intelligently negotiating in this short story is an intelligent negotiation with the tradition it breaks it 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 doesn't break it it only creates some kind of a space of dialogue i don't know whether it satisfies this answer to you not swapna sir yes anybody else yes uh, yes there is another person somebody says that of course let me tell you which story is not political if you look at munshi premchand you is talk talks about dalit issues if you talk about manu bhandari the story which I, is about you know about the politics of gender and of course there are stories by hindi writers which are there are many stories um, if you look at if you include balmiki which is a, again about dalit politics many of course all these writers are 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 writers who are who have a very sharp political consciousness but as i told you one thing politics as i said short story is not an easy allegory of morality i would say short story is also not an easy uh, rhetoric of politics it has a way to deal with politics short story is not propaganda to that extent i mean this is what i if you look at sources of any progressive even progressive in the writers of course munshi premchand said uh, we have stories by fanishrat renu for that matter tisri kasam the movie that is built on made on tisri kasam they talk about the urban rural divide they talk about the the kind of boundary of the city life and the country life all these stories are deeply implicit in political uh, discourses but as said in a very indirect and perhaps as said uh, indirect way and 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 that perhaps is a very intelligent way of dealing with political discourses so many each story in hindi literature there is a dominance of of progressive writers and they are they, they have that sharp political consciousness yes please Yes, sir. There is another person. Of course, I mean writers. Um, of course, realism is one thing which each writer claims to represent or depict. So I've told you, but this realism is has undergone different kind of uh, transformations. For instance, even even in Prem Chand, Prem Chand's realism also undergoes two phases. one phase was called earlier that was called uh, in hindi it is called adarshvadi yatharthavad idealistic idealism where he would show some kind of a 
caste discrimination between a, a Thakur and a low caste, but towards the end, they will be shown in, in, in some kind of amicable light. So this was called idealistic realism. But in a story like Kafan or Puski Rath, you'll find that idealistic realism gives way to what is called realistic realism, where you show all the, you know, all the all the all kinds of divides and fissures in Indian social setup, and you don't try to resolve them. This was called realistic realism. For instance, after Kafan is one story of realistic realism. There's no attempt to hide the 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 so-called callous behavior of the of the two father and son duo in that Kafan. There was no there was no moralistic idealistic easy moralistic ending to the story. But I said depicted in Indian English fiction this has a different kind of a I, I would say uh, this realism if, if you want social realism there's an acute because these people they say Indian Hindi short story has has a greater it it, it this is Menakshi Mukherjee's in fact formulation that uh, Munshi Premchand is is formidable when it comes to depicting the realism of of rural India but he becomes a little shaky when it comes to urban India. Indian English fiction, perhaps I, I would say, has is, is, is has a greater credibility when it, it when it comes to depicting the the existential problems of the urban and the metropolitan, metropolitan life. Yes. So thank you, sir, for giving us time and for accepting. I hope, I hope that uh, uh, I could reach across to your audience. It was my first experience to talk to a very different kind of a cultural group. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome, sir. Uh, welcome to the one day uh, national level e-conference organized by the Department of English, Seva Bharati Mahapitaloy and the Department of English. Uh, Gaurav Guin Memorial College. Uh, dear participants, we are going to start listening to the art of storytelling in uh, Hindi short story. Now we are going to have a discussion on the art of storytelling in prime fiction and for this we have uh, we have an excellent uh, speaker in this session devaditya mukhopadhyay mr devaditya mukhopadhyay assistant professor of english at manikchok college related to university of gorbongo his research articles have been published in peer reviewed journals like new india middle flight p u j e s etc he has also contributed chapter to the collection's entirety, Parenting Through Pop Culture, published in 2020, Excavating Indiana Jones, published in 2020, Critical Insights, Life of Life, published in 2020, and Children and Childhood for Stephen King. It is also published in uh, He also has forthcoming chapters in the collection's Body Count Six and a half case studies in horror comedy, Lee University Press, uh, Press and Adapting Superman and Fallen. So, with this very small introduction, I uh, welcome and invite uh, uh, Professor Mukherjee to please kindly kindly begin the lecture, please. Uh, at first, let me uh, do the mandatory sound check. Shomita, am I audible? Yes, yes. Fine, you're fine. Okay, okay, okay. So I'll begin with a note of thanks in advance to the two wonderful departments of the two respective institutions that have given me this opportunity to share a few of my observations on a particular genre. And I would also like to thank, especially, uh, Dr. Siddhartha Bishash, 
of University of Calcutta. Uh, the reason I think the organizers know well. Now, uh, before I begin my presentation, let me make something clear that uh, I am, although uh, it has been mentioned that I will be talking about crime fiction, uh, let me add that uh, I will be stepping out of fiction per se, and uh, which is why I would prefer to call this presentation a take on crime narratives, that is, uh, I will be incorporating films as well. Now, uh, I'll be using some slides to deliver my brief presentation. So I'll be sharing my screen next. And uh, may I request uh, Shomitda to kindly uh, confirm when I say, when I ask for it, whether the slides are being visible. Okay. Share your, share your. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to do that. Uh, does it appear in the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So from now on, I'll be having a slightly, which I find to be a slightly uh, challenging task for myself. That is uh, speaking without actually looking at the audience. But uh, uh, I would request Shomitda to kindly let me know if there have been any technical glitches as such. For now, as you can see, I have entitled my presentation Formula and Beyond, Mapping the Tellings and Retellings in Crime Narratives. Now, before I begin the presentation per se, let me introduce you people with the outline. I mean, the roadmap that I would like to follow. Now, uh, as you can see, I have mentioned that I will be talking about formula, formula in crime narrative. So right at the beginning, I'll be leaving out crime narratives that do not follow the formula that I am focusing on. Now, let me talk about the formula first, then I'll be briefly referring to the texts, the kind of texts that are not going to be incorporated because they, I think that they are not really following the formula. Now, the first, again, is a subjective response, by the way, but I would like to call all the crime narratives that follow the formula to be a gripping narrative. Now, these, these are the texts that make us skip our lunch, dinners, and stay late until we have it finished. These are the books that make us carry them even when we are traveling. Now, they are certainly gripping, as I said. Now, the second thing that I would like to focus on is they're either told in real time, which, which takes care of the telling part, or they are reconstructed or retold after detection. Now, I'll be taking care of this part eventually, but for now, please bear with me when I say that the telling is about the narratives that take place in real time. For instance, when the, uh, let's say the protagonist is being chased or is chasing something in real time, the narrator is describing it in as, uh, as an ongoing event or retellings. That is something has taken place and the narrator or let's say uh, the narrative uh, itself through 
any of the speakers is eventually going to recollect what actually happened after detecting what happened. So there is also this aspect of retelling as well in the formula narratives. And the last thing that I would like to draw your attention to is that it will always end with a solution. Now, so that is what I believe this formula to be, to be put in a very simple and probably in an oversimplified manner as well. But for now, for this presentation, I would like to highlight on these particular aspects of the formula. Now, as I promised, now let me just mention which are the texts that are certainly very important, perhaps seminal examples of prime narratives that I am going to be leaving out because they don't follow the formula. Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Well, of course, as I began by saying that the very thing about a narrative being gripping or not is a subjective response. So one can certainly debate with me saying that, no, I find the crime and punishment to be very gripping. But pardon me, uh, I don't think crime and punishment is gripping in the sense that, say, perhaps a uh, James Bond novel is. And then again, there are there are novels, short stories that feature crime, that feature uh, people who lark, who function as parts of networks that are not really not really following ethics and legalities always. So even let's say if you are dealing, if you are reading something that has espionage as its focus, it might not be following the formula. For instance, I'll be mentioning here about John Le Carre's A Perfect Spy, which has, which basically is about the psychological angst of Magnus Pym, but not about detection, retelling of uh, the crime scene and all that. But so, I believe I have try I have made my case for what the formula that I think uh, drives a larger section of the crime narrative. Now, as a part of my presentation, now I will be talking about the advent of this formula. And next, I'll be discussing what is it like by referring to a few relevant theorizations on the formula. The next point would be talking about the mediums through which the crime narratives obviously formulate are told and how. I mean, does a particular medium give the suit the crime narratives better? the formulae crime narratives better? If so, why? And towards the end of my presentation, I'll be trying to show how crime narratives are going beyond the formula. Now, as I said, there are already instances of crime narratives that don't follow the formula, like, say, Dostoevsky's crime and punishment. But see, this going beyond the formula is a slightly different thing. That is, you begin with a premise that looks like you are going to enter the formula territory, but then you surprise the readers and you take off to a different direction. So I'll be coming to that later, but now let's uh, let me try to engage you with my bit on the advent of the formula. Now, uh, let me again make a clarifications. I'll be making quite a few clarifications, in fact, because I have, uh, I, it was quite a challenging task for me to try to gather uh, observations, focusing on a particular 
strain of thought about such a vast genre as you can understand but uh, for this presentation i will be using an evolutionary view of the formula now what do i mean by this evolutionary view let me explain now you see uh, there have been critics who have excuse me who have been pointing out so rightly in fact that the advent of uh, crime narratives or to be more specific detective fiction has to do with the coming of uh, the age of reason the beginning of urbanization i mean the urban space as it as we know or know it is often presented argued as a particular space that produces criminals because you know the urban space has a lot of money going around a lot of things happening and when you have such networks running around there of course is a larger potential for three crimes to flourish but i will not be using such takes because you see of course fine i mean if you uh, try to reason thus that uh, as you, as you can see that uh, edgar allan poe's first which is called the first detective story uh, the murder of rue mork it appeared in 19th century but uh, if we think about it don't we have tales of detection don't we have tales of murder don't we have tales of crime prior to that now just let me give you one example which i think as a student of english literature although it is not from english literature per se again but as a student of english literature we are all familiar with sophocles's oedipus isn't it very much about a murder and the detection or better to say the importance of detecting the murderer if we take our hamlet isn't hamlet functioning quite like the detective if we take our macbeth isn't our macduff functioning quite like a detective is isn't macbeth also about the criminal mind so you see narratives of crime narratives of detection they precede the formal beginning of detective fiction which is why i have decided to decided to phrase my presentation as one on crime narratives not detective fiction this distinction has to be made and it is a very important distinction and certainly a subtle one that is you see not every crime fiction is a detective fiction but yes a detective fiction more or less is mostly about a crime so now you see uh, since crime itself our our speculations about crime are can be traced traced back to so many years uh, i mean it's such a, it has such an ancient lineage i believe that it is better to understand it as a uh, a genre a trend of telling stories that has a possible relation with a certain aspect of human nature now what is this certain aspect i'm coming to that but let me take care of the formality first for this part i will be drawing upon a particular book which i find to be a very distinct uh observation uh, analysis of the genre that is mystery and its fictions by david i grosfogel now as you can see grosfogel didn't really even use the word crime in its title he rather called it mystery now 
what is then the relation i mean what makes this interchangeable use possible for gross vogel now gross vogel as i said he believes that the very tradition of telling listening to crime narratives grew out of a certain aspect of human nature and this aspect in question i would like to mention is that mankind has a certain conviction that mystery must be decipherable now what is this mystery about in gross vogel's study there are several pages and the discussion i i i can i i can assure you the discussion is a very very nuanced and uh, sometimes it almost feels like a maze as well but i let me try to pin it down using certain pointers now as you can see our very experience as let's say intelligent animals born in this planet of our surroundings is isn't it dominated by mystery it's dominated by our our experience of death our experience of suffering we have conceived a god in order to explain whatever things are happening around us i mean uh, uh, even the very conception of god often are intimately related to our questions about death our questions about suffering and let me sum up by saying that the very the very decision the very strategy of conceiving about god is basically our attempt collective attempt to resist our anxieties our questions basically unanswerable questions about the unknown whatever we can't understand it's about god i mean uh, if you have read one very i mean there are several but i'm just naming one uh, there there is this poem by browning that i always find to be a very interesting case study of this particular aspect caliban upon setebos where caliban is speculating about how he has conceived a god setebos who is very much like caliban and a, whatever happens in the island the storm the killing of small animals by caliban all are attributed to setebos so you see in a way i am making a very tall claim here but going by the thumb rules of academia i am not really doing it without any substantial evidence to fall back on i believe gross vogel study is putting forward this idea that this very tendency to talk about stories involving crime is as necessary as the in, as the invention of god now let me clarify it further by using the next point now mystery fiction i'm be, i'm i'm quoting this from gross vogel's book itself they are an attempt to come to terms with the mystery of what lies beyond the reach of consciousness now as you can see since humanity can't really take care of all the questions where do we come from where are we headed towards why are we why do we see certain people dying around why do we see suffering in the world why there are certain creatures in the world that harm us why there are certain natural forces that often turn malefic i mean all these questions we really can't find their satisfactory answers but what we can do is we can create something that entertains us 
that distracts us, that relieves us by saying, okay, fine, you have now a set of problems that will be solvable. So basically, just like we are trying to solve our queries by inventing God, we are also trying to solve, at least temporarily, our thirst for unknown, our thirst for knowing the unknown, by talking about mysterious incidents. So the detective story is a mystery created for the sole purpose of effecting its effortless dissipation. So remember what I said about the formula, let me just go back. Detection must end with a solution. So you see the purpose of mystery narratives is to end with a solution so that in some way, in some way we are finding a Let's say, uh, let me borrow the title of a very famous James Bond movie itself, A Quantum of Solace. A Quantum of Solace in, by metonymically replacing the greater mystery with a smaller mystery. That, is, that comes in the form of a narrative. And as you can understand, if the detective is involved, you have the assurance that the mystery is bound to be solved. I mean, Hamlet, Oedipus, they didn't have detectives, but as you can see, it always ends with the mystery getting resolved. Now, let me come to my next pointer, crimes in this way became staple component for mystery fiction. Why? Because crime always raises questions due to its trying, due to its transgressive nature. Now you see the, the transgressive acts of crime. I mean, we can keep on debating about it. I mean, this very notion of transgression will keep on changing. Uh, according to the context, I mean, according to the context of the society, which is judging whether it's a crime or not, according to the time when we are judging whether it's a crime or not, who is judging and what not. But essentially, crime is about transgression, something that you that one does that does not fit with the accepted order. Now, you see, the accepted order here is in a way a reflection of what humanity understands, what humanity can explain. But what humanity cannot explain, they are being represented in crime narratives in a metonymical way, as I said, by acts of crime. So the acts of crime actually can be used in an interchangeable manner with mystery. Now, detective fiction, again, I'll be talking about this part game later on. But since I'm going to round up my, obser my observations that are linked with Grossvogel's study, I'll be referring to this bit here at first. Now, detective fiction involves a game that shrinks the mystery replaces metaphysical mode with mode of play. Now, you see, I, I, I think you can understand what do I actually, or better to say what Grossfogel meant by the metaphysical mode. The things that humanity couldn't understand, aren't they essentially metaphysical? Death, suffering, God, the unknown. Now, this metaphysical mode of unanswered, uncertain, unexplainable stuff are being replaced with a mode of play. Now, why is he talking about play? Again, I'll be coming to this bit later, but just for the sake of initial clarification for my listeners, let me just use this analogy. 
now you see when we you are watching a game of sports you know that there are certain rules that are not meant to be broken i mean if one breaks that the player will be punished accordingly so within the cert, within this fixed set of rules whatever happens that must happen within this certain set of rules so there lies the assurance that whatever happens you will have a solution at the end whatever happens the criminal will be detected and most of the times punished as well so the mystery shrinks of course the greater mystery lies out there in the world but for the narrative the mystery shrinks so in a way in a way this kind of storytelling is a very important mode of digression a digression that ensures that humanity for a for the time being can have a breather from all the unknown all the unexplainable you remember what w h orden comments in the guilty vicarage he calls detective fiction as an escape literature now i have my two bits to comment on that as well whether it's all about escaping or not but the escape element is certainly there and what do you ex- escape from you escape from all the unanswered unanswerable queries so then i would like to round up this slide by referring to another observation by grossfogel which uh, in a way kind of brings together all the different variants of crime narratives you see detective fiction is mentioned the adventure story now again the adventure story is a very broad term an adventure may or may not have a crime involved but again you see when you read a, a you, you read a james bond novel you read a, you read sherlock holmes better to say when you are reading the hound of the baskervilles to be specific there is adventure the element of adventure is there the spy novel the thriller again the thriller is a very broad term it may or may not involve a crime so they are all categorized together by grossfogel and grossfogel calls these as genres with the temptation of character less plot so with this as the take away point from this slide i'll be moving to my next slide which will be showing how this character less plot i mean don't uh take it as a comment on the lack of ethics or morality of the plots but i'll be coming to this bit in the next slide what actually this characterless plot of crime narratives signify and what relevant formula has been invented for showing such plots and as you can see grossvogel rounds up saying that events are more important than the characters engaged now i'm sure this is going to ring some bells for students of aristotle so with that i'll be coming to the next slide now uh, as you can see the source i am referring to predates grossvogel's book but when i was preparing the presentation i felt that it is it only fits if i talk about the advent of the formula first and then bring in this bit or uh, pointed out by sears that talks about the similarities between the structure of detective fiction and aristotelian views on tragedy now you see as i said the basic thing about the formula as grossfogel pointed out is that not much of character but events are important 
Now, with this as a very important focus, Dorothy L. Sayers wrote this very interesting essay that is Aristotle on detective fiction, which kind of speculates what the poetics would have looked like had the, 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 the very references, all the references to tragedy were replaced with the word detective fiction. Now, it, it might sound outrageous, but trust me, it is not. There actually is a very interesting point of similarity between detective fiction and at least the Aristotelian view of tragedy. Now, let me let me introduce you to the similarities point I pointed out by Sayers one by one. Now, as you all remember your, dis, your definition of tragedy from poetics, it has to be a serious action, right? So isn't murder a serious action as well? Now, if you, if you are going to counter saying that is crying only about murder, well, certainly not. And unless, of course, you are reading something like uh, an excellent parody, by the way, uh, Shishendu Mukhopadhyay's uh, famous comic detective stories featuring Goenda Boroda Charon, where he is investigating uh, a case of Lao Churi. Crimes are always serious, right? Because you remember that bit on crimes being transgressive. They are serious because they disturb the set of order, the set of things to be. I mean, the moment we see a murder taking, taking place in open daylight, we are disturbed because that kind of implies that such murders, such crimes, robberies can take place anywhere. So murder or crime per se, they are always serious. According to Aristotle, action is more important than characters in a tragedy and the same holds true for detective story. Now, once again, you have all the, all the rights to counter me here, saying that if a character is not important for detective story, what are we doing with all these famous characters that we have? But let me ask you a question. You, I mean you, whoever are thinking thus. Do the detectives really evolve through the course of the stories, the series that they feature in? I don't think so. And, you know, I mean, we. I think we have all discussed this bit in detail about what does it mean to have... Uh, I mean, an action which may not require characters. I mean, Aristotle's bit on tragedy, having action as the more important thing, does not really imply that there won't be characters. There certainly would be characters, but the characters would only be there to contribute to the development of the action. And that is what holds true for detective stories. I mean, we really don't have our detectives having their standalone features. I mean, we can have, there of course have been some interesting films, some spin-off stuff, but they are exceptions. By thumb rule, we have the detective whenever there is a crime. And then you have this bit about the similarity of the structure. We all remember beginning, middle, end, right? So the beginning has to be with a murder or the crime. The middle will be about the detection and the end will be with the discovery. So it all fits. But let me point, on, point out two more important similarities here. One is the peripety, the, you know, the reversal of fortune, the reversal of fate. Now, this bit 
takes care. This bit you can find in the detective stories when you look at the victims. Either like in case of murder, there is, there is someone who dies. Normally they are rich people or at least people of considerable wealth or social reputation. And sometimes they, you have another interesting reversal that is from dead to alive. Now, I don't think I have time for referring to these instances in details. I mean, in terms of uh, referring to the plots. But please, whoever haven't, please have a look at Laura by Vera Caspari, where this eponymous character, I mean, the whole thing is about her being dead, but at the end it is revealed that she was not. So then you have the anagnorisis part. Now here it becomes really interesting to find the similarity. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, now, Aristotle mentions several modes of anagnosis or discovery. You have discovery, I mean, I'm not mentioning all, but I'm mentioning the relevance only, where lies the similarity. That is, you have discovery by tokens and signs in tragedy. Now, aren't they very similar to the clues that the detectives find? Do you have discovery through reasoning? Isn't that very similar to what you have in Edgar Allan Poe's Dupont stories, the ratiocination part? I mean, Dupont just sits comfortably in his armchair and thinks about the crime and comes up with a solution. I mean, next you have discovery through bad reasoning by other party. This is what Aristotle says. Now, in detective fictions or crime narratives, there are several instances of faux pas. That is, when the criminal himself or herself lets loose, divulges certain information, that leads to his or her exposure. I mean, if you uh, just go by any... Uh, detective story where the criminal accidentally lets loose of what he did by directly or indirectly. For instance, there is this famous pattern where the detective asks the criminal, so are you sure uh, about the, the fact that this weapon was indeed used in the crime or not. And the criminal replies, I can vouch for it that it was not used. As, uh, rather, this was used. So right at that moment, the detective gets him or her. How do you know? So you see, there indeed are many interesting similarities between the structure of detective fiction and Aristotelian views on tragedy. But what does it all mean? It all means that somehow our crime narratives, particularly the ones that feature the detectives or that focus on the detection part, I mean, you know, there can be narratives which really don't feature detectives, but the element of detection is there, right? I mean, uh, journalists, I'll be referring to one such case uh, towards the end. Journalists can detect certain things. Lawyers can do that. But the thing is the detection part, this very pattern of having a crime and then it being detected, this is always presented in a structured manner. And why framing such structures, consciously or unconsciously, the makers, the contributors to the development of crime narratives have borrowed elements from one of the, one of the oldest genres that we have come by, the tragedy. Now, uh, any discussion on 
detective fiction crime narratives i think would be incomplete without referring to zvetan todorov's uh, famous essay i mean an extract basically typology of detective fiction from the poetics of prose now i'll be referring to this in order to show you how eventually the crime narratives developed into three basic types according to todorov now you can again counter saying that no there can cannot be three i mean, i am saying fine there can be 33 or more in fact but what i'm trying to draw your attention to here is that eventually permutation and through permutation and combination a tendency to go beyond the formula also started now that i think is what every genre fiction popular fiction is about you can't really have a progress without breaking the existing sets of rule i mean you don't just break it right away wholesale but some departures have to be there now how these departures grew let us let us see using todoro's ideas now todoro first talks about who done it i have used both spellings here because i mean i uh, as far as i know both are correct but uh, in order to avoid confusion i did use the two here, both here now uh, the who done it part according to todoro would be consisting of two stories the story of crime that is what really happened and then there would be the story of detection that is how the reader came to know about it so you see here who done its are basically about retellings because you don't see the crime happening right in front of your eyes you only find out how it gets detected so naturally who done it requires that one cannot use an omniscient narrator of course there can be exceptions and as students of recent undergraduate courses probably uh, all of us are aware of one interesting who done it which nearly has an omniscient as well as an unreliable narrator but i'll be coming to that part later but let me just point out this bit that normally in a who done it you can't have an omniscient narrator and again this is not me but todoro i mean you can see here whatever ross hogel said an echo of it everything must be justified no loose ends now the second category of crime narrative that todoro talks about it's thriller now here again you have those two stories they will always be there in todoro's categorizations but the difference lies in the fact that here the story of crime would be suppressed and instead the letter that is uh, the what really happened that takes the center and of course there again are exceptions dashiel hammett and raymond chandler stories the hard boiled detective fiction where the element of mystery stays now you see already you can see that there attempts were being made to come up with different permutations and combinations how i mean either you have a beginning with a crime taking place but you have it half narrated so that eventually when you uh, go about the rest of the story you have the detection as well as the mystery part staying together and more importantly here in thrillers the detective is not necessarily always the supreme holier 
than thou kind of individual. He also might, he or she might also be under risks. And with that comes the third category, that is suspense novel. Now, here, as Todoro has said, the mystery of the past and curiosity about the present runs parallelly. How, I mean, here he says that the ideal example of suspense novel would be one where the story of the suspect as detective. I mean, an individual has been charged with a crime and then it is the individual's responsibility to find out what really happened in order to prove his or her innocence. Now, I'm, I'm going to refer to a very memorable film here uh, featuring Tom Cruise Minority Report, where you have this police officer who is suddenly predicted to commit a crime. There, there, there is this interesting system of precog machines involving three uh, human individuals who can predict the future. And then he, it, he tries to come up with facts that prove that he might not actually commit the crime in reality. So the suspense novel, as Todoro says, is a combination of whodunit and the thriller. Now with that, I would have ended Todoro's, uh, 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 my overview of Todoro's uh, observations, but I couldn't resist the temptation of adding a bit of my own observation. That is, you see, through Todoro really doesn't specifically talk about spy thriller when he talks about thriller. And as I told you, remember, thriller is a format. It can be used for comedies. It can be used for sports narrative. It can be used for anything that thrills you. But spy thriller, spy thriller has some element of distinction, which I believe is that you see in about these two stories, that is the story of crime. I mean, what really happened and the story of detection, they are all there in the spy thriller. But in spy thriller, after knowing what really happened, spy has to ensure that things are not revealed to the public person. And I'll be referring to Casino Royale. You see, towards the end of Casino Royale, Bond discovers that his love interest in the thriller, who, with whom, in fact, Bond even wanted to uh, start a fresh life, giving up his profession, was actually another spy. And that spy really loved him. But when it comes to the, the end of the novel, Bond really does not disclose much about his love interest to his higher authority. Rather, he sums up using a very popular slang, which I'm not going to use. But uh, <coughs> as I said, <coughs> eventually, as you can see, with the advent of spy thriller, we have an interesting departure from the formula that mysteries are being solved, but, but there is a facade that the mystery is solved not for the every, not for the society per se. Of course, the readers will be the secret sharers with the finder of the secret, but not for everyone, like the detail, like in the detective story where you have the detective bringing in a large audience and disclosing this and that happened. So with that, I'll be moving to the next important theorization that I believe would be helping you to have an understanding. Now, this is George N. Dove who came up with this idea that when you are reading the formula fiction, it's not the formula, but the process is important. Now, this, I believe, is another instance of a development where you have 
a tendency to go beyond the formula. I can see that I'm probably running a little uh, late, so I'll be uh, referring to these in a rather hasty manner. So you can see uh, this was essentially a response to critics like Edmund Wilson in the first place. Uh, I, I'm sure quite a few have already read Who Cares Who Killed Roger Ackroyd, where Edmund Wilson, who is otherwise a very sound critic, uh, responds to detective fiction and crime narratives with a lot of, uh, I mean, unjustified anger, I would say. Because, and uh, what also George N. Duff has to say that, Edmund Wilson is frustrated because these narratives are always repeating the same thing again and again. But according to George and Dove, this repetition is also important. Why? And that, I think, takes care of the point that I'm trying to talk about here. I mean, what's the point in telling the same stories over and over again if uh, you are just repeating the same formula. According to George N. Duff, when traditions become established and acceptable to later readers, they become conventions which are necessary for a viable relationship between author and reader. So the reader becomes a participant knowing that whatever he or she is going to read will be formulaic. And uh, to borrow George and Dub's interesting phrase here, it creates an comfortable. It creates a comfortable old shoe effect. So the reader comes to the these texts with certain expectations, and then uh, George and Dub uh, talks about the three basic features that ensure that the expectations are fulfilled. That is one is the game element. You remember my beat on the game element uh, towards the beginning of the presentation. That is certain rules are always going to be obeyed. Then you have the delay element. And lastly, you have the shock element. Now, <clears throat> as I said, in case of crime narratives, you have the assurance that you have a set of rules for you here. And whatever goes on, will take place according to the rules only. Now, next you have the delay. Now, you see, that creates the suspense, right? I mean, the revelation could be right at the first paragraph, but would you be reading the, re the rest of the story? So, this element of delay, and you see the reader, as George N. Dub says, signs up knowing that there will be delays. So, the fun lies in the delay. And George Endov is refer has referred to Lola Butt's uh, ideas about the dilatory morphemes here. I'm not reading them out, as I said before. And then there is also a reference to Dennis Porter's interesting piece, Backward Construction and the Art of Suspense, where again he refers to Peripetia, but in a different manner. He said that he says that there are crime narratives where you have the detection almost coming to the closure and then you have an element of digression that uh, because the detective has been all wrong or the criminal has outwitted the detective. If you uh, remember your Hound of the Buskervilles, you would remember the chase sequence uh, in London that takes place between the criminal and Holmes, where the criminal outwits Holmes by posing as Holmes. Uh, then you have the deflection from progress, uh, the, which is uh, what this peripetia part about. Then you have, uh, Porter says, the anti-detective. I mean, the criminal is described as the anti-detective. I mean, if the detective is concerned about disclosing the truth, the criminal does the opposite, that is covering up the truth. And then you have eccentricities uh, cities of the main characters, descriptive passages. I mean, all these things, according to Porter, they ensure that you don't have the discovery right at the beginning. The discovery is going to be delayed. But again, that is what the reader signs up for. But again, I mean, even amid such fixed patterns, there would be shocks, according to Dove, which are unexpected events, but uh, he warns that they are to be used moderately only. 
And finally, I uh, end this beat on Georgian Dove by saying that the suspense is created by such in such narratives by a tension created by two voices. One is the voice of the narrative. He says voice of the novel, which keeps saying mystery. This mystery in hand is exceptional. I mean, if you remember any uh, any famous case of Sherlock Holmes, it always uh, begins with the impression that this time the mystery is something exceptional. This will not have an easy resolution. But eventually it has. And there comes the next part, the voice of cognition. So a reader who is experienced with what Sherlock Holmes stories are like, he or she will always have the second voice running at the back of his or mind, which is going to assure him or her that, okay, fine, you don't need to worry, Holmes will set the day. So the suspense is created by an interplay of these two things. That on the one hand, the narrative tells you, no, 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 this time you are not going to have an easy resolution. And on the other hand, the, you have your experience telling you it's fine. At the end of everything, you, you will have a resolution. So with these, I think I have uh, managed to uh, share a few ideas about the possible ways uh, the formula narratives are uh, told, but now I would refer to the possible me the mediums and how they uniquely influence the tellings. Now, you see, uh, from the very beginning, you can understand that short story is more suitable for crime narratives. This is what Julian Simons would also agree with, because you see in short story, you don't require much of character development. You just require one single incident and you have the option of involving the end twist part. So short story suffices as an ideal medium of crime narratives. Now, just let us have a reality check. How does the detective, the genre of detective fiction have its formal beginning with a short story by Edgar Allan Poe? And even the Holmes novels were less popular than the stories, which may be a surprise fact, but it's true. And if we refer to our own Feluda novels, which I think have always uh, at some part or point or the other have made us wonder why there are so many references to travelings, food, uh, description of the background. I would somehow this bit by saying that apart from the killers and the crimes, there have to be fillers as well when you transfer the crime narrative into the domain of a novel. Because you see, Feluda's character never really grows. You don't see Feluda falling in love. You don't see Feluda suddenly having a bad mood. Feluda stays as he is. So, in order to make up for that lack of character development, which crime narratives can't really have, you have these bits. And even uh, I would refer to another very interesting uh, uh, example, Shajarud Kata, where you see the detection is really important, but it is also, I mean, from the very beginning, it looks like a love story, which again is, is, is in contrast to S.S. Van Dyne's formulation, uh, the, the, the 20 rules that he shared that were, that were formulated that says that you can't have a love affair in a detective story. But again, there are exceptions. That is, Christie's novels are comparatively better. I mean, Simmons says that short stories are better suited, but also adds that when you have Christie, you have better novels than short stories. And then if we if I come to the Film part, I'll all I'll have, I must refer to the use of the noir, the film noir for crime uh, for narrating crime. Uh, I will be quickly showing you a, a picture here. Uh, show me the is the picture being seen by everyone? No. Okay. No. No. Okay, okay, okay. I think I have to close this bit first. 
and um, yeah, I think this should do. Uh, is it visible now? Uh, yes. Okay. As you can see here, it's one of the, I mean, I would say one of the generic examples of a film noir. You have two silhouette figures walking in light and shadow. I mean, film noir became an ideally suitable subgenre or genre. I mean, there again are several debates about film noir, whether film noir is just an expression or it's just about uh, the setting, but not a genre or a subgenre. I'm not getting into that, but just see that and try to uh, have uh try to try to focus on the fact that these are not simply black and white pictures these involve a very interesting interplay of light and shadow which in a way reflects the mystery part the enigma that surrounds us that as i said as grosvogel has said we are trying to counter when we are forging the crime narratives. Now I'll be uh, getting back to my slide again, because uh, I just have uh, one or two more slides to show and talk about. Um, yeah. So, and then I would also refer to another interesting effect that is frequently used in crime films, that is the Rashomon effect, where you have several witnesses, several people involved in the crime scene telling the same scenario from different points of view. And I have referred to two very familiar films here. One is the Bomkesh Boxi adaptation by Anjan Dutta of 2016, and the second would be Ittafak, which is a remake of the uh, 1960s film featuring Rajesh Khanna. Now, I, I wish I could have uh, talked in further details about these two films, but I, I, as I can see, I have already overstayed my presentation. I'll be, I'll be just sweeping over. Now, what Rashomon effect enables the crime narratives in films is to give a better view of detection process which you see in fiction, it is not really possible to shift, to keep on shifting the points of view. It's either the detective's assistant or the detective himself who is going to be the teller of the story. But uh, in case of uh, films featuring Rashomon effect, you, uh, the makers can easily shift showing all the different points of view. And more importantly, they can show how false narratives are created. Because you see, from all the different uh, narrations of the same incident, there will be moments where, like uh, what we saw while talking about Sears, that faux pas moment would be there. And from this, a, a very interesting derivative eventually de develop, where you have crime films where trickery wins. I am referring to two interesting examples. One is the usual suspects and the other is our very own Drisham, where you have, I mean, two are quite different, in fact, in, uh, particularly uh, about when you are talking about the purpose of creating the false narrative. In the first case, a criminal is saving himself and the second, in the second, a family is trying to save uh, its members because of an accident. Now, uh, with my in my last slide, I'm trying to very briefly mention how crime narratives are going beyond the formula. First, I would mention is when the detective is getting defeated and you will see this becoming a recurrent part of cases where you have departures from the formula. And I am referring first to a scandal in Bohemia where Holmes gladly accepts defeat to Irene Adler and lets her be. But why and how, I am sorry, I'm not going to talk about that. Then 
as I said towards the very beginning, that sometimes you have the criminal as the narrator, and which is where the murder of Roger Ackroyd comes in. Uh, as you can, as you all know, Doctor Shepherd remains the narrator, who who has committed the murder, and then you have mockeries of the detection process, where I mean, by referring to Borges's very interesting story, Death and the Compass, where the criminal traps the detective lone root by using the detective's tendency to overinterpret crimes. I mean, he makes the crime scenario look such that the detective is tempted to move in a certain direction, which enables the villain to trap him. And then you have Umberto Eco's famous novel, The Name of the Rose, where you have, again, almost similar to Borges, that the detective thinks that there is a pattern, but the criminal actually was not following a pattern. And then I would also mention the cases of occult detectives where you see the mystery doesn't fully getting resolved, doesn't really get fully resolved because of the occult elements, the paranormal elements, which never really are resolved. Rather, the detective uh, just saves the victims and makes home. And uh, you can find this bit from Maurizio Ascari's uh, interesting monograph, which is a counter history of crime fiction, which talks about the presence of the irrational in crime narrative. So with at this point, I would like to draw your attention to a possible reason of going beyond the formula. You see, when crime narratives were invented to be a replica to be a mock, to give a mock satisfaction about the uh, inability to solve the larger mysteries, something was buried within the genre. Something was buried within the narratives. But then you have the eruption of the irrational, the unknown, in the form of such happenings. And these are better understood in case of occult detectives. And with uh, that, I would also try to uh, draw your attention to the, the three other developments that I believe are instances of going beyond formula. One is an, a very interesting change of focus on criminals. Now, these are particularly found in serial killer narratives. I am referring just briefly to one interesting series. Anyone interested, please find this. It is really interesting. You have this character, Dexter Morgan, who is a serial killer who kills other criminals. And the narrative is about, therefore, the successfulness of the crimes of a criminal. So you see the subversion here. And there is there are also films uh, about the unsolvability of mystery. Again, you have the serial killer figure in these I am referring to the film Zodiac. I'm referring to Anurag Kashyap's Raman Raghav 2.0. Particularly in Raman Raghav, there is something interesting because you see, uh, in there, there, there you can see that the police, the 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 ACP Raghavan, he tries to take advantage of the presence of serial killers in society by committing crimes, imitating the manner of the serial killer. So that the public, for the public, it appears that it's the serial killer again. And again, I would be referring to another interesting development, which I think I mentioned at, just towards the beginning. That is, you see, in crime narratives, women are often treated as the root cause of crime. But even this is being changed. And I would refer to uh, an interesting case, Val McDermott's uh, report for mother, which, by the way, features a journalist, and she is a lesbian. And lastly, with this case, Earthly Remains by Donna Leon, it's a very recent novel. With this, I would draw your attention to, which I believe is one of the recent most developments in uh, within the genre of crime narratives, which shows 
crime narratives where the detectives the detectives answerability the detectives engagement with crime is problematized you see detectives are essentially meant to be the guardians of the system because as i said at the beginning crimes disturb the system and it's the detective who sets it right but what if the detective finds that it is the system itself which is responsible for crimes crimes against nature what should the detective do that's what the this recent variant uh, eco detective narratives talk about i am just referring briefly to one novel earthly remains by dona leon it's a very famous she is a very famous writer who has this detective guido brunetti and in this uh, novel earthly remains guido begins his investigation by not investigating the death of an individual but the death of bees in an island so with that i would wrap up my presentation by saying that the formula was invented in order to come to terms with the incomprehensibility but when the the system itself is beginning to look incomprehensible with the lack of lawlessness with the with the increase of our awareness about the system's responsibility towards environmental damage probably the, these tendencies of growing beyond the fab formula are there to stay so i end my presentation i really really thank all of you for your patience because uh i went on for quite a bit i guess uh, excellent presentation uh, sir uh, there are many questions from the participants I'm okay sharing Ah uh, yes, thank you, Shor Abda, for this question. I, I uh, first let me apologize for skipping this part, but as you can see, I was actually running out of time in a terrible, terrible manner. So uh, yes, uh, I think I did mention this part. You know, uh, the Rashomon effect, for instance. I mean, the Rashomon effect enables uh, the makers to present. different points of view towards the to to the readers but i don't think you can have you can have that in a classic detective narrative and if you are talking about web series what i am really curious about is that i believe i mean it's already there in some detective games but uh, i'm sure you are aware with this format of interactive films Well, we we really had one very interesting instance in i guess in 2018 when we had we saw black mirror the bender snatch uh, where you can have the option of uh, choosing what happens next and so according to that the narrative will keep on unfolding so i am waiting for uh, the arrival of something like that i think the ott platform or the web series gives this unique opportunity of delving further with the uh, with the narrative being unfolded uh, into various interesting permutation and combination and as uh, george and dove has said the reader the viewer can act as a participant in it so i hope that kind of answers this question but thank you for the wonderful question Next question is from Vijay Karwar. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Ah, uh, yes, yes, certainly, certainly, it is. Uh, we have, uh, and um, uh, we, you know, there lies the fact that these are safe entertainments. I mean. you have you can experience the thrill of being part of an investigation if you go back to ss vandine's formulations the 20 essential rules 
about uh, detect, uh, detective narratives. That is, the reader is going to be as important as the detective. And what I also referred to in my presentation by quoting George and Dove, that the reader becomes a participant. So in a way, yes, uh, the, when the detective gradually unfolds the mysteries, the reader uh, and I would, uh, I would be, I'm actually tempted to even say that uh, I have seen in some veteran readers that there is a sort of a competition whether they can come up with the solution even before the uh, detective does in the text. So yes, and uh, if you uh, are interested in uh, knowing one particular variant of the detective genre when where we have this escape from mundane affairs. I would be referring to the hard-boiled ones or uh, the Noah maybe, where you have the abundance of uh, shady things happening around us. So that's an escape, but yes, it's a safe escape. Okay, so you have another question. Okay. Okay, that's a very interesting thing. To ask, and do you think that non-fictional crime narratives such as yes, 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 of course. In fact, I was just thinking last night whether I would be uh, referring to a film which I find uh, is a spot-on case of what you are asking here, Nightcrawler, where you have the journalist actually arranging the dead body in uh, such a manner so that it gives him a better camera view. And yes, uh, I think uh, crime narratives are also talking about uh, the problem involved in journalistic reportage and media sensationalizing crime. So I think you have already seen this film, but if you haven't, uh, I think you should see this Nightcrawler. Amazing film, talking just what you are asking about. Yes, there is another question from Aishi Chandra. Aishi Chandra. Okay. Uh, film noir and crime fiction follow similar narration. Now, um, you see, film noir, again, film noir is not always about crime. But if it is about crime, then I would say that uh, it normally follows the narration pattern of hard-boiled detective fiction, not the golden age variant. Because you see in the hard-boiled, as I was talking about during my presentation, the crime, you have a brief glimpse of the crime at the beginning, but you don't get to know the whole thing. So the mystery remains about that part. And then you have the detective pursuing the detection process amidst a world which, as I showed using that one single picture, full of shadows, light and darkness. So uh, crime, not crime fiction per se, but I would say film noir goes, let me put it this way, hand in glove with hard-boiled detection. This is from Suhopia. Okay. How important is the setting in the case of a thriller? Why does the author provide more and more information about the background in case of a thriller? Can it be regarded as another formula? Um, one way of answering this, I think, would be to refer to George and Dub's uh, bit on the building of suspense through delays. Right. You see, in just like I was saying that uh, if the writer wishes, you can have the expose of the criminal right at the beginning, right at the first paragraph. But there will be delays because that contributes to the building of suspense, which the reader expects from the text. And so... Uh, if you have uh, settings, detailed description of settings, that I think adds 
as a welcome digression. And uh, another thing I would like to mention is if the setting in question is uh, of a particular nature, let's say uh, a gloomy, dark one, then I think it also in a way mirrors the existing dominance of mystery that, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, that crime narratives are intended to counter by very existence. And yes, it can, I think, be regarded as another formula. But uh, I think I did mention about this part as well. I, or not me, I mean George and Duff, the delay part. Yeah. This is from Somnath Haldar. Yeah, uh, but you see, uh, I did acknowledge this bit right at the beginning that the socio-political scenarios certainly play important role in crime narratives. For instance, you see the very uh, conception, the very act of considering something as a crime changes if the socio-political scenario is going to change. Uh, I, would, I would also refer to my last uh, bit where I was talking about the advent of the eco-detective narratives. You see, uh, if a detective is, uh, which is the way, which is the case with most of these eco-detective narratives, if a detective has to fight with someone who is trying to uh, kind of fight back to a company, let's say a multinational global company that is damaging the environment itself, so. In the case of this change of scenario, the very take, the very decision to call it, a, whether it, whether to call it a crime or not, is changing. And yes, from time to time, crime will be changing. The notion of criminality will be changing. The last question from IOC Jones. Acha, this is... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I must thank all the people who have uh, taken their time to post such wonderful queries. I'm really delighted. But um, I would request you to pardon me because, you see, this beat requires, I think, a separate presentation altogether. But I'll try to just briefly answer your question. I, as I was uh, referring to Anjan Dutta's film or uh, Drisham, sorry, Anjan Dutta's film, the, it has uh, Kurosawa's Rashomon effect as it, as it is, but I think Drisham would be uh, an, uh, an even more interesting uh, example to give in order to explain this bit. You see the usual suspects, the maker of the film, the uh, usual suspects, Brian Singer, when he was asked whether uh, to what extent uh, is he inspired by Kurosawa's Rashomon effect, as you have correctly mentioned, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned it as well that Rashomon effect is has owes its very existence to Kurosawa's famous film Rashomon. But uh, as I was uh, trying to tell you, uh, Singer says that in usual suspect, this very uh, narrative pattern that uh, the convict just comes up with a very convincing uh, story with which he tricks the investigator. Uh, it owes something to Kurosawa's Rashomon effect by way of co-opting this bit in Rashomon effect, which shows that with the change of point of view, the same event can be narrated in different manner, firstly. And secondly, coming up with a false narrative is possible if you take note of certain details. I think this part is more important. If you have seen Drisham, I mean, I, I, I'm sure probably you have. Uh, the, the character played by Ajay Devgan in the film, Vijay Salgaonkar, he, as you can see in the film, he is just uh, a sort of an addict to films. He runs a, uh, he's a cable operator basically. He watches a lot of films. 
so he can easily come up with a possible way of creating a narrative that can convince the police so again we are going back to kurosawa i guess here because it's all about changing the point of view it's all about uh, noting the minute details so that you can rearrange them in order to come up with an alternative narrative but with a lot of conviction so i would i again i apologize for not answering this sufficiently but i think this would have required a separate presentation but this is a very very interesting query and i would request you to pursue this uh, further so thank you devadipto for accepting our invitation and for such a wonderful lecture you, you see that uh, your your presentation has uh, attracted so many queries so many uh, questions i i i must thank uh, you and shorabda for organizing this so wonderfully and the uh, questions they really they were really interesting i am really thankful to each and every person who cared to question okay thank you devadipta now we are at the very end of this highly interactive session highly interesting session and i would request dr sourav pal assistant professor and hod department of english gorab guin memorial college for the vote of thanks sourav da please uh shomit i am am i audible yes you are audible. am i audible swamit yes yes go on yes okay okay thank you uh good afternoon we have come to the last part of a wonderful e conference and it is now time to deliver the vote of thanks i dr shourav pal as the convener of the present webinar convey my thankfulness and gratitude to all the participants of this one day national level e conference for being connected to us so long with patience and enriching us with their valuable comments and questions from time to time your eager participation in the conversation indeed makes our conference meaningful because it is really about sharing our thoughts as students and lovers of literature and the perennial flow of storytelling that is an integral part of our life i must express our sincere gratitude to our four learned research, resource persons professor amrit sen professor niladri ranjan chatterjee professor akshay kumar and mr devaditta mukhopadhyay who have so kindly agreed to spare their precious time for sharing their thoughts with us and enlightened us with their brilliant speeches we really enjoyed their wonderful and in-depth analysis of the various aspects of storytelling thank you your wonderful presentations indeed made our efforts in organizing this this e conference worth something i also thank our two chief patrons dr tapan hajra respected teacher in charge of gorab guin memorial college and dr binod choudhury respected vice principal of seva bharati mahavidyalaya for their support in organizing this webinar we are also very much grateful to the members of the organizing committee of this e conference the teachers of the department of english gorab guin memorial college and the department of english of seva bharati mahavidyalaya for the help and support they have provided in organizing this webinar at the same time i must thank dr shomit maithi assistant professor and head of the department of english of seva bharati mahavidyalaya and the joint convener of this program for remaining ever active in the background dealing with the technical side of the e conference which was very necessary to make it successful last but not the least i express my sincere thankfulness to all the teachers students and scholars 
from different institutions without whose presence this program could not be successful with this i proclaim this e conference a grand success and let us call it a day wish you all best of luck thank you and goodbye thank you surabha thank you